Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. My name is Jad al -Hijani. I'm a third year medical student and today inshallah I'll be giving you the uh, radiology crash course. Uh, in, this, um, in this session inshallah I'll be preparing you for everything coming in your midterm and uh, hopefully you'll benefit. So uh, uh, in this presentation I'd first start by covering the introduction to radiology and the radiation shielding. Moving on to the second section with the intro to uh, CT it's clinical applications and basically everything related to uh, CT. And finally, we'll move on to the um, uh, contrast and patient preparation. Now, after each section, I'll have a set of questions related to that section. So we'll be answering them together. Uh, so I guess you can start now. Uh, so the first part will basically be all the physics stuff. And then we'll move on to the um, actual radiology and the radiation shielding. Uh, starting by the introduction. So uh, this is just general background information about uh, defining uh, medical imaging. So medical imaging, um, there isn't much to explain here. It's the technique of processing uh, uh, of, and process of creating visual representations of the body for clinical diagnosis and intervention. So basically, we're, uh, we're trying to find any abnormalities in the body, for example, any fractures, any stones, and so on. And then we'll, and ba based on the image, we'll be intervening, uh, whether it's surgical or or basically anything, uh, uh, how to solve the issue. So uh, how did uh, radiology begin? They, we have this uh, German physicist or scientist, Wilhelm Conrad Jonsen. And um, so he's known as the father of radiology. Uh, he basically uh, he basically was the first one to uh, uh, use radiology or use x-rays to visualize the body by uh, uh, visualizing his wife's hand under x-ray. Now, for the uh, early use of radiology, it was first used in the 1940s to screen for tuberculosis. And then for the bad uses, we have the uh, uh, basically nuclear fission, where they, used, where they used it for atomic bombs. So this is just a general introduction. Now, moving on to the actual material for the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we talk about radiology, obviously, first thing we have to think of is the electromagnetic spectrum, because it shows you all the, um, uh, all the waves or all the kind of radiation we have. So in the electromagnetic spectrum, we start with radio waves, microwaves, moving on up to uh, X-rays and gamma rays. Now, along the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, what is the difference we find? Uh, so um, uh, as you can see here, wait, let me use the laser pointer. Um, OK, so as you can see in the beginning here in, at the radio waves part, the waves are more spaced apart and larger. And then moving on to the gamma rays, they'll be closer apart and narrower. So uh, moving from radio waves to gamma rays, we have increase in frequency of the waves, but we have uh, a shorter wavelength. So how does this make any difference? Now, the frequency is what will uh, determine if the energy will be high or low. So uh, that being said, moving on to this side, moving on to X-rays and gamma rays, will have higher energy because they will have higher frequency and lower wavelength. Now, if they have higher energy, we will consider them as uh, ionizing radiation. But if they are at the other side, at the radio waves and the microwaves, there will be non-ionizing radiation. Now, when I say ionizing radiation, what modality do you think of? Do you think of, um, for example, CT or MRI or ultrasound? You can type in the chat. Okay, we got CT, we got MRI. Okay, so, so yes. Uh, so this diagram will clarify it. Now, um, at the X-ray side, obviously we'll have the X-rays. Now, CT is a modality that also utilizes X-rays. So in the X-ray tube, um, we'll have the, I'll be explaining it in a bit. Uh, from the X-ray tube, we'll have the X-rays or the uh, radiation going off. And this radiation is considered ionizing. Hence, X-rays and CT will be considered ionizing radiation, uh, which also means that for a certain population, we can't use it since it's ionizing, so it's harmful. For example, in pregnant ladies, uh, you try to minimize the X-ray and CT exposure as much as possible. Meanwhile, in MRI and ultrasound, you utilize other forms uh, of radiation. So, um, for example, in MRI, you know, it's uh, due to the uh, hydrogen and the spin of the uh, and the spin of the uh, uh, cells basically, or the protons. So um, this will be non-ionizing, so it's it would be safer compared to the ionizing radiation. 
So that is it about the electromagnetic spectrum. Now let's dive deeper into the X-rays itself. Now, how do we get the final image we see on an, on an X-ray? We start with the X-ray tube, which is this device here. This will emit the radiation, emit the X-rays, which will hit the subject or the patient. And then finally, produce, producing the image we see, which is the X-ray. Now, uh, let's, again, dig deeper to the X-ray tube itself. So this is a schematic diagram showing us the X-ray tube. Here we have uh, the cathode, here we have the anode, and we have the microfilament. Now, what exactly is happening here? Um, uh, first thing I, I want to remember is that the cathode is the uh, negative side, and uh, the anode is the pos positive side. Um, so um, uh, starting with the cathode, the cathode is the uh, microfilament. So here we have uh, an electric current moving uh, through the microfilament at the cathode side. And the anode is basically the material where the electrons will hit. So this material is usually uh, tungsten. Uh, but in other forms of radiation, we'll have different materials. We'll be talking about them uh, in a bit. But for now, I want you to remember that the target material at the anode is usually tungsten. Now, what happens when we start the electric current? You start the electric current, it will, uh, it will go through the cathode, and now the cathode will start shooting electrons. You see those smooth things, those are the electrons shooting from the cathode to the anode. And then from the anode, they'll start reflecting, and then they'll pro uh, produce the X-ray waves, which is what we want, because the X-ray tube will be giving us the radiation. So this is the radiation coming from the cathode shooting electrons to the anode. But you need to remember that. When the cathode shoots those electrons, most of the energy will be transferred as heat and not as X-rays. Now, if we have excessive heat coming off, you need a cooling mechanism, hence the water here. So the water here will be cooling down the anode because uh, the, most of the energy will be released as heat. And now here we have the X-ray uh, uh, shining or basically being emitted from the X-ray tube. Now, we have two things to remember here, KVP and MA. KVP is basically the voltage or the energy across the, uh, the uh, X-ray tube. And MA is the current or the number of electrons uh, being um, and basically being emitted or shot from the uh, cathode. So uh, I want you to remember that KVP, since it's the energy, if you increase it, you increase the dose, which is more harmful to the patient. And at the same time, because you have excessive penetration, it will distort the image. So having a high KVP is not a good thing uh, because it will destroy the image and be harmful at the same time. So you need to have uh, enough energy to produce a good image, but up to a certain extent only. Meanwhile, for MA or the number of electrons, if you have more electrons, you'd have a clearer image, but again, it will be harmful to the patient. So you need to keep those uh, two things in mind whenever you think about the uh, do uh, dosage for the patient. So high KVP and high MA will both harm the patient. Uh, high KVP will also make the, the image worse. So uh, that is it for the uh, X-ray tube itself. Now, uh, we, we, we have two different types of um, uh, basically radiation coming off the X-ray tube. It can either be general radiation or characteristic radiation. Now, the general radiation, also known as Bernstrahlung, whatever that is. So general radiation is, uh, uh, is basically most of the... Um, interaction or, or most of the radiation coming off the, the x-ray tube. Now, this is also called the breaking energy. What happens here is that the electron will be shot off from the cathode, and then when it reaches the anode, so we said uh, anode is usually made of tungsten, or it could be other, other things at the same time. So uh, when it goes close uh, into the, uh, to the anode, instead of uh, directly hitting any of the electrons, it will only slow down and change its direction. So when it slows down, it will lose some of its energy, and we know energy has, has to go somewhere. It can't just disappear. So this energy lost will give us the X-ray. So this will uh, give us the X-ray uh, photon. And um, what you need to remember here is that the electron will only slow down and change its direction. It's only getting diverted, but it's not actually affecting any of the electrons here. Meanwhile, in characteristic radiation, we have uh, something different going on. So this will give us the photoelectric effect. Now, for characteristic radiation, what happens is you have the electron coming, and then it will uh, it will hit an electron. It won't just divert. It will hit an electron, and the, this electron will be scattered. Now, when this electron is scattered, one other electron will come and replace it. 
So this electron will come from an outer shell going uh, inside to another shell. So again, it will go from high energy and to, it will have to lose this energy to replace um, the scattered electron. So this will give us the emitted X-ray. And this will give us the photoelectric effect, which will produce the image. So the general X-rays will not contribute to the image formation. The characteristic radiation, which uh, in which there is an electron being hit and scattered, and then you have another electron replacing it, and then you get the emitted X-ray. This will contribute to the image formation in, um, in the X-ray. So uh, we said this is the X-ray tube. We have uh, here the cathode, the anode, and the X-ray being emitted. Now, I also want you to remember that the cathode, that the electrons that are, will hit here, and then uh, let's let's describe in this diagram. So in this diagram, here we have the cathode, and here we have the anode. The electrons coming closer to the anode will be of higher intensity. Okay, so they will put the, they will have the highest energy. Meanwhile, the ones that are down here they will have less intensity. So how do we translate that? So here we have the cathode side, here we have the anode side. Uh, the closer they are to the cathode, the more the characteristic radiation. And we said the characteristic radiation is the one that produces our image. So here we have the characteristic radiation being produced basically from those electrons, uh, uh, the ones closer to the, um, the cathode side. And the, and the ones here, they will give us more of the general radiation. And again, one other thing you have to notice is that you have more of the general radiation compared to the characteristic radiation. So now we described the radiation coming from the X-ray tube. So from the X-ray tube, you either have the general radiation or you have the characteristic radiation. Now we said, remember the three boxes we have, we have the X-ray tube and then we have the subject, then we have the image. Now the X-rays interaction with the subject or the X-rays interaction with the matter, it can either be Compton scatter or inelastic recoil or photoelectric uh, effects. And you also have uh, elastic recoil and pair production. Now these are less, less significant. Elastic re recoil barely contributes to the image. Photoelectric effect is the most important. And Compton, Compton scatter is the thing we try to reduce. So this is just a picture describing them uh, generally. We'll be explaining each one of them in detail. Now here we have the Compton scatter, which is the inelastic recoil. Now here, as you can see, you have the incoming uh, X-ray photon. Uh, it left the X-ray tube, and now it's coming towards the body or uh, towards the matter. Uh, what happens here is that it will come, it will push an electron, and then continue its way. Now, when it pushes an electron, um, th this scattered electron, uh, I mean the scattered photon, will also lose some of its energy. Hence, uh, we have the E1 greater than E2. So the incident ray will have more energy than the uh, ray coming out because when the photon hit, uh, hits the electron, it will lose some of its energy. And this will only produce Compton scatter. Compton scatter is not something we want. So it's just scatter. It won't contribute to the image that we want. Meanwhile, we have something called the photoelectric effect. Now here you have the X-ray pushing an electron here, outgoing electron, and then you have an electron replacing it, and you have characteristic X-ray being produced. Now, um, so here um, you can see this is the photoelectric effect, which is the one you want, which is the one that will give us the image. So you have the uh, photon hitting, and then the energy of the photon will be much higher than the uh, binding energy. So now it will push uh, an inner electron, another electron will replace it, and, and energy will be lost. So here you have another diagram again. It will uh, push the electron out, the electron will be scattered and will be replaced. And then you have um, the X-ray being emitted. Now, the likelihood of this happening increases with atomic number. So you don't have to go into details about this, but I mean, it's good to know that if you have a higher atomic number, you ha you'll have more chances of getting a photoelectric effect. Uh, now, we also have elastic scatter. Uh, as, you, as we mentioned here, we have Compton scatter, uh, photoelectric effect, and the elastic recoil. Elastic recoil won't contribute much uh, to the image. So it's basically just 10% of the interaction where um, E1 equals E2. So basically the X-ray just comes and bounces. Nothing will happen here. Uh, you, you need to focus on the um, Compton scatter and the photoelectric effect. Now, um, uh, there's a question in the chat. So this is effective because of characteristic radiation. Yes, exactly. So the uh, uh, characteristic radiation will give us the photoelectric effect. So we have the uh, general radiation, which will only produce scatter. 
and you have the uh, characteristic radiation, which will give us the photoelectric effect, producing the image we see finally. Uh, so these are the most important interactions that we need to know. Elastic scatter or elastic recoil is not important. It does not contribute to the, to the image. Now, um, another another concept is the uh, collimation. We're basically shaping the X-ray before it interacts with the body. So when the X-ray is emitted from the X-ray tube and hits the body, you have a lot of scatter and some of the photoelectric effect. Now, uh, to try to reduce the scatter and... Um, and get more of the photoelectric effect, we do something called collimation, which will shape the X-rays in a way that improves the image quality. So this will decrease the scatter. Why do we want to decrease the scatter? What's the problem with scatter? Now scatter, we said, will not produce any uh, uh, useful image. It won't contribute to the image, plus it will harm the body. So it's basically just radiation coming into the body, jumping around, uh, harming the body without actually forming an image. So you'll try to mi minimize this amount of energy and focus only on the photoelectric effect to get uh, the uh, benefits. Now, um, here we have the X-ray beam filter. Now, this is another way of uh, also reducing the scatter and uh, only producing a ca uh, characteristic, um, I mean, photoelectric effect. So we said uh, we can uh, shape the X-ray or we, we can use a filter. Now the filter will also again shape the X-ray in a way that we will reduce the scatter. Uh, for example, here we have the bow tie filter used for just X-ray. We have different shapes uh, of filters for the X-rays. Um, and now, um, uh, for example, for chest, we have the uh, bow tie filter. What happens here is that this will, uh, this will decrease the amount of uh, scatter and the radiation that's unnecessary and will help us get uh, the image we want, which is a clear image and that, uh, with the minimal harm to the patient. So we talked about the collimation, we talked about the filter. Now, uh, so this is what happens in the body. You have the X-ray tube, which emits the X-ray beam, interacts with the body, and finally it will uh, hit the receptor where the image is being formed. Now, uh, when the image is formed, as you can, uh, if, if you've seen any X-ray before, you can tell there are different shades. So, uh, so some parts will be white, other parts will be black, others will be different shades of gray. Now, uh, what happens here is that, um, let's look at B2, for example. You can see it's very white. So can anyone in the chat tell me what, uh, what is represented by B2? Is it, for example, the lungs? Is it uh, internal organs? Is it bones? Yes, exactly. So uh, white will represent the bones. Now, if we have uh, dark black, no, this is full black, not gray. Yes, exactly. This would be the lung. Yes, air, which is the lung in, in the body. Now, the different shades of gray would be different tissues. So according to their density, they either uh, look like dark gray or light gray. Okay. Now, talking about scatter. We discussed uh, scatter before. So a scatter will degrade the quality and increase the, do the dose, as I mentioned before. So um, um, when we have an, an X-ray shooting into the body, um, most of it will be scattered. Most will not produce a specific image that we want. So this will only harm the patient by increasing the dose that is reaching the patient and will result in a distorted image. So it's not focused. So how do you improve the image quality? We can place a grid. Now this grid, uh, which, which is basically an aluminum sheet usually, that this will only allow the X-rays that are perpendicularly hitting the uh, the grid to pass. Uh, so uh, in other words, those that are scattered that are at a different angles will not pass through and will not reach, reach the patient. So you can see here the scattered X-rays will not reach the patient. So this will decrease the scatter, improve the image quality, and decrease the dose uh, reaching the patient. Another method is an air gap. So by installing an air gap here, you have less of the scatter reaching the receptor. And less, um, so the image here will be clearer because uh, not all the scatter is reaching the receptor. Now, if you imagine the scatter, the um, body being very close to the receptor, uh, whatever X-rays would reach the receptor, and uh, this will include the good ones that are the photoelectric effect with the scatter. But if you increase the gaps, if you have an air gap, you have less of the scatter reaching the receptor, hence a better quality of the image. Now, talking about image quality, Wait, let me check the chart. Okay, there's nothing here. So, uh, talking about image quality, we have three things to keep in mind when we talk about quality. We have the spatial resolution, you have the contrast resolution, and the temporal resolution. 
And when we talk about resolution, the resolution of any image is basically its clarity again. But you have different types of clarity. For the spatial resolution, starting with this one, sorry, yeah. So uh, those two images. Now, spatial resolution is basically the ability to distinguish two adjacent lines. Uh, so this is applied in X-rays. And um, as you can see here, um, here we have the normal X-ray image. This one uh, is the one with low spatial resolution. So um, the problem basically here is the focal spot. So the focal spot is the area which the, elect the electrons hit. So if you have a large uh, focal spot, and now the um, basically the receptor won't tell that these are two different objects and it will consider them as one. So here you have um, the, the image will basically look pixelated. So you can see it's large squares into, instead of being tiny focused ones. So can you see much detail here? You can't really see much details. So in X-rays, uh, for example, if you if you want to tell fractures or any calcifications, you need it to be uh, of high spatial resolution so you can see the tiny details. So this uh, so the spatial resolution will be improved by small focal spots. So for example, a focal spot of 0.3 millimeters will have higher spatial resolution than one with, for example, three millimeters. So this will have good spatial resolution. This one has bad spatial resolution. Now to the second type of resolution, which is contrast resolution. Now contrast is basically the shades on the grayscale. Now uh, this one here uh, will have low contrast resolution. So this is basically important in X-rays, obviously, and specifically in um, mammograms too. In mammograms, you need to have both high contrast resolution and high spatial resolution. Why do we need the contrast resolution? Because uh, this is, for example, a um, um, mammogram. So uh, here in mammography, you're looking at the breast tissue. Now, breast tissue will have fatty tissue and the soft glandular, uh, glandular tissue. So uh, different uh, conditions will either increase the fatty tissue or increase the glandular tissue. So these will, uh, these will have different shades. So you need to have good contrast resolution so you can tell is there more of the, um, more of the glandular tissue, more of the fatty tissue, is this cancerous, is this benign? So you need to have high contrast resolution in mammography. And you also have to have high spatial resolution. And this is important for microcalcifications. So microcalcifications are basically the small white dots you see here. So um, sometimes they are uh, an early sign of cancer. So you need high spatial resolution because we uh, remember how we said uh, spatial resolution is uh, basically the ability to distinguish between two lines or two uh, dots. So if you have fo a small focal spot, you can see those uh, small details. So microcalcifications can be seen if you have high spatial resolution. And contrast resolution, we needed to, to see the different shades on a grayscale. Contrast resolution is improved by decreasing the KVP. Remember we said KVP is the voltage or the energy across the X-ray tube. And we said if you have high energy, you have too much penetration and it will distort the image. So uh, this makes sense uh, because uh, if you decrease the energy, decrease the KVP, you would improve the contrast resolution to a certain extent, obviously, because you need uh, sufficient energy to produce the image, just not too much energy. So decreasing the KVP below 35 will give you a better contrast resolution. Having a small focal spot will give you a better spatial resolution. And finally, we have temporal resolution. Now, uh, uh, ability, uh, temporal resolution is the ability to capture moving objects at different points and uh, moving at uh, different points in time. So this is measured in frames per second. When do you need to uh, see moving objects? So um, moving objects, for example, when you do a barium swallow to test the esophagus. So uh, here you have the esophagus. And uh, barium sp swallow will basically show you if there is, um, if, for example, any spasm in the esophagus, any obstruction in the esophagus, uh, and so on. So you need it for a barium swallow, uh, also in uh, coronary angiogram. So for example, in angiograms, uh, you're visualizing the vessels and the heart. So again, you need a uh, good temporal resolution because you're measuring moving objects. So it's either in barium swallow, in fluoroscopy, or coronary an angiogram. So here we talked about spatial resolution, contrast resolution, and temporal resolution. And that's it for image quality. Radiation dose control. Uh, now, uh, the dose is basically the amount of energy that is reaching the body. So uh, if you have too much energy, it will be, again, harmful to the body. 
Uh, we talked about this previously, so it's just quick revision. Um, you have a KVP. We said KVP is um, the amount of energy across the tube uh, that will um, that's basically re representing the voltage. So uh, this has an exponential relationship with the dose. So this is the graph, for example. So doubling the voltage will give you four times the dose. And, and uh, in that sense, decreasing the KVP by half will give you quarter. So here you have an exponential relationship, not a linear relationship. Meanwhile, uh, for MA or the current, we said MA is basically the, um, um, the amount of electrons uh, going across the tube and reaching the body. So here, this is a linear relationship. So doubling the current will give you only double the dose. So um, in that sense, uh, when you talk about KVP, KVP is the most important thing to control when uh, when you want to control the dose because it will give you uh, an exponential relationship, not just a linear relationship. So first you have to control the KVP and then you control the current. So you, you try to, re to reduce the voltage and then you try to reduce the current. And you also, uh, to control the dose, you also reduce the scatter by uh, using filters or ECA. Remember we talked about filters like the bow tie filter for the chest. We also talked about the grid and the grid, uh, uh, which is basically the aluminum sheet, reducing the scatter, reaching the body, and also the ECA. Uh, here, as you can see, the uh, scatter here will mostly reach the receptor, but if you increase the ECA, you have less of the scatter reaching uh, the receptor. And this uh, is uh, basically for radiation control, uh, controlling the amount of energy that would reach the human body. Now we covered the uh, first lecture, which is uh, into the to the um, into to the radiology, into the X-rays, and all the physics stuff. Now we we're gonna move on to the radiation exposure and the patient protection. Uh, do you have any questions before um, proceeding to the next part? All clear. So. Uh, now, for the radiation exposure, um, now we have uh, a stochastic or deterministic um, uh, examples. So here for the stochastic, uh, stochastic um, radiation will basically uh, be not dose dependent. So uh, here you have the prob probability increases with increasing dose. So if you increase the dose in the body, you have an increased chance of getting um, th this issue. For example, here in this case, you have cancer. So if you have increased dose, you have increased chances of getting uh, cancer, but there is no specific threshold. So it's not dose dependent. You can't say that after getting this dose, for example, um, 30 kVp, yes, you will get cancer after this point. It's not dose dependent. There is no th threshold, but the probability increases with increasing uh, exposure. But the de deterministic effect is dose dependent. So you have a, th a threshold here. So for example, uh, here you have cell necrosis. So uh, after a certain limit, uh, increasing the dose will give you cell necrosis. Uh, so um, we have cancer for the stochastic effect. You have cell necrosis for the deterministic effect. Um, for radiation protection, um, we try to limit the exposure of health questions by the Alara principle. Now, Alara principle is very important. It comes in every exam. You have to remember it because uh, Alara first stands for as low as reasonably achievable. You have to remember what the what the letters stand for. So Alara stands for as low as reasonably achievable. And the things you have to consider in Alara are the time, the distance, and the shielding. Uh, you, it's very possible for you to get an MCQ and with the different um, choices, for example, they try to confuse you, saying uh, time, shielding, and dose. So you have to remember it's time, distance, and shielding. And Alara stands for as low as reasonably achievable. Now we also have the ICIP, um, uh, ICIP uh, principle, which has uh, justification, optimization, and dose limits. We'll talk about them one by one, starting with the Alara principle. So here for time, now, um, now, when you think about it, uh, for the radiation protection, uh, if you expose the patient for uh, a long time to radiation, you'll have uh, more harm to the body because um, you have, if, so here, let's say, if you have less time spent near the radiation source, you have less uh, radiation absorbed. So if you expose the patient for radiation for a, uh, for a longer period of time, more of the radiation will be absorbed and it will harm the body. 
So this is important for personnel such as radiation therapists and physicists. So for example, basically anyone who is trying to uh, uh, screen a patient, they will uh, accumulate radiation over time. So to try to decrease the uh, exposure time for, these, uh, for this radiation uh, to protect the body. So uh, this is for time. Now moving on to distance. Now, uh, the inverse square law states that the radiation exposure and distance are inversely related. What does that mean? So if you have increased distance from the source, you have less exposure or less intensity of the radiation uh, hitting the body. So uh, this means that the distance from the source, uh, uh, as the distance from the source increases, increasing uh, the intensity of radiation will uh, decrease. So first the time, you try to decrease the time, you try to increase the distance, and finally for the shield, uh, shielding. So uh, basically you use the different materials to uh, shield the body. Uh, for example, you have the lead aprons, you have uh, thyroid shields, the eye shields, and um, um, even in the rooms when where you try to screen the patient, you have to have the, the equipment and everything which is basically shielding the body to protect the, uh, the sensitive organs like the thyroid, for example. So these are the accessories. You have the thyroid shield, you have the aprons and so on. Now, linear attenuation coefficient. This will help you decide which, um, which elements or which um, substances would be the best for shielding. Now, judging by the numbers, uh, here you have the highest numbers for copper. So copper will be the best material to shield the patient. However, as I mentioned here, we use that instead of copper. And that is only because copper is very expensive. So uh, um, hospitals usually use lead for the um, protection, uh, for the uh, aprons, for the uh, thyroid shields, for everything basically. Now, for the ICRP principle, we discussed uh, Alara, which had the time, distance, and uh, the shielding. Now, for ICIP, they focus on justification. So, um, in, in brief words, justification uh, means um, the uh, benefit to the patient has to have, uh, um, you know, has to outweigh the negative consequences of the uh, examination. So, basically, we said x rays are obviously they, they're ionizing radiation, so they will harm the patient. And then CTs, CTs are um, and basically the mode of um, they, they're trying to screen the patient with x-rays, but it's, uh, it has uh, any multiple in the effect of, uh, of x-rays in CT will be much higher than x-rays. So you have more, even high radiation in CT. So this will be hard for the, to the patient. However, if the patient had a trauma and you want to screen them, uh, in this case, the chances of the patient having something really harmful or really bad, like a stroke, for example, uh, or any type of hematoma in the brain, uh, the chances of uh, it happening is very high, and you really need to prevent that. So here, the benefits will outweigh the risk of CT. CT will have high radiation. It will be harmful to, to the patient, but if you don't do CT, you are uh, keeping the patient at risk of bleeding to death, for example, or uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So here, the benefits outweigh the risks, and uh, hence, um, justification. Now, for optimization, Whenever you have to do the X-ray or you have to do the uh, mode of radiation, you have to, uh, to make sure it's as less as possible, as low as possible. So we have uh, is sufficient quality, but the dose is not excessive to the patient. So again, we go to the same example. If the patient had uh, trauma and you want to screen them to make sure there is no intracranial hemorrhage, no bleeding in the brain, uh, you don't expose the whole patient to the uh, to the CT. You only expose the specific organ or the specific parts you need to screen. So here in this case, for example, you need you do a CT for the brain, for the head only. You don't have to do it for the chest and the abdomen and everything. So uh, here, this is for optimization. Now for the dose limits. Uh, now, um, again, this is to ensure that the individuals are not exposed to an unnecessary high amount of ionizing radiation. So uh, this would only apply to a expo uh, occupationally exposed workers. We don't think about those limits when you think about patients. So um, in, in patients, you don't think about those limits, but uh, for the ex uh, occupationally exposed workers, for example, the, uh, for example, the radiologist himself, you need to think about the dose limits. So what, what do you need to focus on? So here, uh, there, uh, there are some numbers you need to remember. So a limit of the effective dose of 20 millisieverts per year average over five years, and the equivalent dose should not exceed those numbers. So what is the effective dose and the equivalent dose? Equivalent dose is basically the uh, dose that uh, reaches specific organs, 
and uh, effective dose is just the sum of everything uh, affecting the whole body. So the equivalent dose, for example, for the lens of the eye is 150, for the skin is 500, and for the hands and feet is 500 again. So uh, the equivalent dose should not exceed those numbers for those specific organs. And then for the effective dose hitting the whole body, 20 millisievert per year um, for the whole body. So that is it for the ICRP principle. So we discussed a lot here. Uh, we discussed area for the time, distance, and shielding. This is the most important thing you need to focus on. And for the ICIP, you have ju justification that the benefits should outweigh the risks, optimization that you don't screen the whole body when you need only to screen a specific organ, and finally the dose limits. Uh, now, uh, here in, uh, this is a diagram that was uh, in your lectures, but they don't really get uh, questions from here. Uh, all you need to know that you have the absorbed dose, the equivalent dose, and the effective dose. Uh, absorbed dose is basically the interaction with air. So here you have the absorbed dose, and then the equ equivalent dose uh, for the specific organs, and finally for the effective dose uh, for the whole body. Uh, so uh, the X-ray will first interact with air, and then it will interact with the body uh, for, with the different organs, having different effects on different organs. So uh, this uh, was it for the first section. Uh, with, uh, we covered the intro to, um, intro to X-rays, uh, we covered all the physics and the background information. Then we moved on to the radiation shielding and the protection for the patients and the uh, occupationally exposed workers. Now we have a set of questions uh, covering those uh, uh, those aspects. But let me check the chat. Um, okay, we can start with the first question and then answer in the chat. So here we have a 55-year-old female uh, complaining of swelling in the breast. An examination was performed, and which of the following is the most appropriate regarding this examination? Okay. Anthony. Tamam. Okay, so everyone's saying D, and yes, that is the correct answer. We said in mammography, we try to increase the spatial resolution and uh, the uh, contrast resolution. So um, higher spatial resolution is um, is basically how do you get higher spatial resolution? Can anyone tell me in the chat? How do you increase the spatial resolution? Okay, the image will look like less pixelated. And how do you get that? Small focal spot, yes, exactly. You decrease the focal spot. Smaller focal spot will give you a better spatial resolution. Now, um, for the contrast resolution, we increase the contrast resolution by decreasing the KDP or the voltage. Now, uh, okay, so for the other options, uh, this is not ultrasound, this is mammography. And here uh, you can see there are calcification, there is something wrong going on. And we did say that uh, usually you have tungsten as the uh, target material. However, in mammography, you uh, replace, replace tungsten by another material for, to increase the contrast uh, resolution. Uh, the material is called my myop. Wait, I have it here. One second. Oops. So um, here, when we talked about the contrast resolution, um, molybdenum is used as a target material instead of tungsten for mammography. So this will improve the contrast material and uh, basically improve the image. But usually we have tungsten as the contrast material. So you need to remember that in mammography, you have higher spatial resolution than general X-rays. Next question. Which of the following most appropriately describes ionizing radiation? We have A, we have B. More answers. B. Tell me. Any more answers? B. 
A. Okay. For this question, it's both A and B. May cause DNA injury and has high frequency in microwaves. Remember when we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum, we said more to the side with the high frequency and less wavelength, you will have a more ionizing radiation. So at that side, what do we have? We have the X-rays, we have the gamma rays, and uh, all that. Meanwhile, on the other side, with the lower with the lower frequency and higher wavelength, you have the radio waves, microwaves, basically the safer ones. So ionizing radiation will have a higher risk of causing DNA injury, a higher risk, for example, of causing cancer. Uh, but the non-ionizing radiation will be safer. So uh, ionizing radiation will cause DNA injury and has higher frequency than uh, microwaves. Microwaves is uh, towards the um, high, uh, low frequency, high wavelength. Meanwhile, we have the X-rays and the ga gamma rays at the high frequency, low wavelength side. One more question. Protection against ionizing radiation depends on which factors? Okay. okay, everyone is answering A. Good job. So what what do we call this? Can anyone remind me what do you call this? Yes, the Alara principle. So Alara principle is, uh, is responsible for the protection against ionizing radiation, and it depends on the time, the distance, and the shielding. So uh, I don't think there's a problem with this question. We can move on to the next one. A 12-year-old girl presents to the emergency room with a suspected right wrist uh, fracture, and a decision was made to do a radiographic uh, evaluation for the patient. In the view of the Alara principle, which of the following is the most appropriate? We have D. Okay, everyone's saying D. Tim. So the correct answer is D. Again, as we said, uh, we have um, the patient only has a right wrist, uh, wrist fracture, so it's not um, it's not a major trauma. It's not something that you need to screen the whole body for. So when we talked about the Alara principle and the ICRP, we said there has to be um, justification, optimization, and those limits. So for it, uh, in this case, we're thinking about which aspects? We're thinking about um, uh, optimization. So you only do the X-ray for the suspected side and suspected parts. So a patient with a right wrist fracture does not need a whole chest X-ray and everything. So you only do X-ray for the suspected side. You don't need to do it for the upper and lower limbs. Um, and um, here treat the patient without exposing here to ionizing radiation. Now, uh, you need to do ionizing radiation because it's... Uh, it's the best modality to see the fracture. In this case, you need X-rays. So um, you only you have to expose it to ionizing radiation, but the lowest dose possible, and only for the uh, for the site that you need. Uh, in what case can C be right? Okay, so uh, treat the patient without exposing here to ionizing radiation. When I talked about the electromagnetic spectrum, I said the X-rays and the CT will be more ionizing, so you don't use them for a certain population. Can anyone remind me what that population was? Now in the chat. Okay, the population you need to screen without exposing to ionizing radiation. Yes, exactly. Children and pregnant ladies. So uh, uh, children, for example, uh, if they're very young, you try to go for the less uh, ionizing radiation or the uh, less ionizing modalities. And uh, pregnant ladies, obviously, because it can harm, harm the, uh, the fetus. So what you do is, if you can, you can go to uh, for other non-ionizing options, for example, in MRIs, because MRIs do not utilize X-rays, but for the spin of the uh, hydrogen atoms. And uh, you can go for ultrasounds, because ultrasounds, again, they only use for uh, the reflection of sound waves. So there's nothing ionizing them. So uh, it depends on what exactly you're screening for. But in children and pregnant ladies, you try 
not to use ionizing radiation. But here in this case, you have right risk fracture. You just need to X-ray that certain part. So it's fine. You can you can use the ionizing radiation, but keep the Alari principle in mind and keep the justification and optimization in mind at the same time. Now, I think I have one more question for this. Which of the following groups are those radiation limits uh, by the ICRP applicable on? Okay, this is an easy question. Tama, we said that the dose limits will apply on occupation exposed workers only. Because in patients, uh, for example, uh, patients, you need to screen them. So there will be a, a high high fraction of radiation um, uh, reaching them. However, the doctor, because uh, they're screening multiple patients uh, on a continuous basis, so you try to have a, a dose limit reaching those patients, so uh, those doctors. So it's only for uh, occupationally exposed workers, not for all hospital employees, because not everyone is exposed to radiation and managers are by the same logic, and patients because they need to have a certain dose in order to be screened. So uh, here we'll start with the second section, which is the introduction to uh, CT and its clinical application. Now, uh, I think it's uh, Maghrib time now. Would you like to take a short break to pray and come back, or should we continue and take a break later? Okay. Okay, then, um, host, can we have a short break? And then let's say we come back in 10 minutes. Is 10 minutes good? No. Okay, so we're back with section two. Uh, everything about CTs, basically. Uh, introduction to CTs and its clinical application. So let's start with introducing what CT is. CT stands for computed tomography. So uh, what is happening here is basically you're taking slices of tissue to visualize in the third dimension. What does that mean? So uh, uh, when when we're talking about x-rays, you're seeing everything from a flat surface. So you're seeing, for example, anterior, uh, anterior view or posterior view, and you're only seeing what's happening um, just looking at a 2D image. So if you have something, let's say if you see any uh, mass or any tumor, you can only see, okay, mashi, and it's at the top or it's in the middle, it's uh, it's at the bottom, but you can't specify the location of the uh, of the tumor. But here in a CT, let's look at this image. Let me use the laser pointer. Okay, so let's look at this image. You can see the tumor is exactly in which segment and which lobe of the lung. So it will give you a 3D image instead of a 2D, a 2D like the X-rays. Uh, but the process is still identical to x-rays. So you have the beam released from x-ray tube, and then it uh, hits the subject, and then it forms the image. So the process is identical to the x-ray, but the only difference is that uh, CT will have more than one projection. Uh, so, uh, for example, we said in x-rays, you have the x-ray tube, it will release the x-rays and will hit the subject producing the image. CT will have more than one projection. So let's look at this. So here you have the x-ray tube, it will project the x-rays, but you have more than one projection and it will keep rotating around the uh, around the patient. So you'll get more than uh, one image and then they will overlap. So here you rotate the tube and the receptor around the patient. So this is the receptor side, this is the tube, and then you accumulate the data and then you produce the image. So let's look at the, uh, at the process. Here you have the X-ray tube rotating around the patient and then it will produce 2D uh, projections. So you, you only have the attenuations. So here you're looking at the attenuations and it will give you an it will give you basically a 2D image. So here uh, they will uh, be reconstructed, and then you will put the slices above each other. We said CT computer tomography uh, stands for slices. So you have the X-ray slices, then you start building them on top of each other, and then you form the matrix. So here uh, this is the matrix, uh, and then it will give you a 3D image. So the 3D image will basically be the CT. So as we said, you have the same uh, same exact things. You have the X-ray tube, you have the uh, uh, subject, and you have the image. Only difference is that you have multiple projections and you get a 3D image. For the uh, image quality, again, because it's the same concept, so again, you have spatial resolution, contrast resolution, and all that. So the, uh, we said the spatial resolution is to distinguish two adjacent lines. And we said we can improve the spatial resolution by decreasing the focal spot or using a small focal spot. Contrast resolution, on the other hand, is by differentiating the different shades of gray for different densities. So uh, uh, something denser would not look like something that is air. So we said air would look uh, uh, black or dark, while bone would look bright or white. 
Temporal resolution, we said, is for moving objects, and it has frames over time. So moving objects, we said like a barium swallow or angiography. We use the, the barium swallow for the esophagus to check any abnormalities in the esophagus, for example, or for the stomach, and an angiography for the vessels. And we also have something called the scan time or the brief, uh, breathing artifacts. So um, here, uh, for the scan time, um, you need to keep in mind that in uh, some um, some modalities, sometimes when you uh, want to x-ray the patient or you, you want to do anything, CT, MRI, you'll ask the patient to hold their breath so you can uh, better visualize. So for example, if any of you have uh, gotten an x-ray before, uh, they take uh, they ask you to take a deep breath and then hold it. And then they uh, starting the, the image. But uh, you have something called a breathing artifact. So the patient can't hold their breath for a long time. So you need to keep in mind that the scan time also will uh, result in uh, some issues. So if the scan time is too long, the patient won't be able to hold their breath for long, and then this will affect uh, the image. Uh, they will start breathing, and then this will uh, distort the X-ray or the CT. So spatial resolution, we said um, there, there is something you need to keep in mind, which is the detector, side, the detector size. So this will affect the spatial resolution how? So uh, this is a CT image. Uh, first, we looked at the X-ray with, uh, with low resolution, low spatial resolution. Here, we have the CT. So you can see it's a slice. It's a cross-section here in this case. Um, the texture size here is 7.5 millimeters, while here, uh, it's 0 0.625 millimeters. So here you have... Um, uh, larger detector size. How does this affect? Here you have another image to explain it uh, more clearly. Here the detector size is very big compared to this one. You have smaller detectors. So a big detectors would not identify the gap between those. So to, in this detector, it will see one. Here we'll, we'll see one. It will consider them as one large object. So hence, in this, uh, in this CT, you will see that you have larger uh, squares or larger pixels. In this case, on the other hand, you have smaller detector size, so it can see that there is a gap between them. So it will see the small details. You you can display uh, the objects as separate. So here you have a clearer CT image. So in, for example, in the CT, you can see this is the aorta. Here you have the vertebral bodies. Here you have um, the bones. You can see the bones in white. Here you have the heart. So you can see the specific details. Meanwhile, here everything is just white and gray. You can't really tell the details. But for contrast resolution, we said the contrast is the changes in the uh, um, uh, shades of gray. So bone will normally appear white, and the lung will appear black. So this is the lung, and here you have the ribs, so you can see them as white. Um, here you have the different organs. So soft tissues will be variable. Uh, soft tissues will be between the black and the white, so not uh, either extremes. So it will be variable shades of gray. For example, here, which organ is this? Anyone tell me in the chat? Can you guess which organ this is? Okay. Yes, so this is the liver here. And what do you have under the liver? Yes, so this is the kidney. So here we have the liver, here we have the kidney. Here you have the arch of the aorta, here you have the, uh, uh, the bones, which are the ribs. So you have different shades. So uh, there is one thing you need to keep in mind. So uh, kidneys are soft tissue, so obviously they're going to be shades of gray, but here they appear very white. Why? Because in CTs, we sometimes introduce contrast. The contrast is usually iodine. You have different types of contrast. So contrast will also affect the shades you see uh, in the image. So uh, one, one thing is the contrast will appear bright. So, um, and uh, another thing you need to keep in mind is the timing of the contrast. So uh, when you first introduce the contrast, some things will light up, and then if you wait, other things uh, the or the shades will change. So if you uh, time uh, if you time it a bit early, what will light up? Uh, here you have, for example, the aortic arch and the arteries will um, will receive uh, the contrast first, so they will start lighting up. And so here, uh, if uh, if you have an um, for example, the early image after uh, after introducing the contrast, you will see the aortic arch will be bright, and uh, kidneys which receive the arterial flow from the aorta will be um, dominantly bright. So here you can see the, uh, the kidney will be lighting up because this is early contrast. Uh, later on, the contrast will start moving, and then you'll see specific uh, specific details. But we'll talk about contrast later. For now, just remember that more and white, very black, and then soft tissue will be different shades. So this is for contrast resolution. 
How for attenuation? We talked about attenuation when we described the uh, different shades of gray you get when the X-ray hits. So attenuation coefficient is basically a measure of how much the ray will be weakened by the material it, it passes through. So um, uh, this is a formula for attenuation coefficient, which is the attenuation of the substance minus the attenuation of water over the attenuation of water times a 1,000. Now, this is just equations. Let's talk about specific numbers. I want you to remember that <clears throat> the attenuation of water is zero, and so it appears as dark gray. So that makes sense because uh, if, if you have the substance as water, so you have the same uh, the number minus the same number. So obviously the equation will get will equal to zero. So attenuation of water is zero. Now uh, air would be less uh, will have a less number. So number lower than zero, usually negative five hundred will be the attenuation for air. So it will appear as black. So which organ will have attenuation need negative five hundred Hausfeld units? The units here in this case is Hausfeld units. So which one will have an own negative 500? You can type in the chat. Yes, the lungs, exactly. And then you have muscles around 40. So they will appear as light gray. And finally, the brightest, which will have around 150 to 500, will appear white. So uh, these will have the highest attenuation. It will appear the brightest. You have around 150 to 500 in, in the bones. So remember, water is zero. Air will be around negative 500 muscle around 40, and the bones will be very high. Now, this is for attenuation coefficient. Now, speaking of attenuation, we have something called a window. So the win window level is the center at which the image uh, the image is, is the plate, uh, displayed. Now, uh, window width is the range of attenuation. So you have if you have a wider uh, uh, window width, you have a bigger range of attenuation, so you can see more structures. So, for example, if you look at, at the normal CT, you'll be uh, you'll be able to see the different structures. For the, uh, for example, this one, you'll be able to see the bones, you're able to see the heart, the different organs, the aorta, and so on, the muscles at the back. But sometimes you adjust the width or adjust the level or, or adjust the window to see specific stuff. So, for example, if you need to focus at a specific organ to diagnose a pathology, to see something, you don't want to see all the structures. You try to focus the window level at the level appropriate for that organ. So let's say I want to diagnose any abnormality or any uh, pathology in the lungs. So what uh, window would I have? I'll have the lung window. The lung window will have specific attenuation around a specific number. We said the lungs are full of air. So that attenuation would be closer to negative 500, for example. Meanwhile, if I want the bone window, then focus the attenuations, I'll focus the window at the range for the bones. So I'll focus at around 150, 500, that range. I don't want to see all the structures. I just want to see a specific structure. Now, that being said, Let's look at this image. What is the structure that you can see uh, the clearest? So if, if there's any abnormality, you can see the most. Can you tell me the chat? Exactly the answer. So which window is this? The lung window. So any abnormality in the lung, any fibrosis, any uh, um, tumors will be clearest in the lungs. So this is the lung window and uh, the attenuation will be around negative 500. Here, which window is this? Okay, close enough. So we call this, yes, exactly, the media, mediastinum. So this is the mediastinal window because you can see all the structures in the mediastinum. You can see the aorta, you can see the vessels. So, But can you see the lungs clearly? You can't really see the lungs. So this is not a lung window because if there's any abnormality in the lung, you can't tell, you can't see anything. But if there's an abnormality in the mediastinum, you can easily tell. So this is the mediastinal window. This one is the lung window. Next one, here. Which one, which organ is the clearest? Yes, liver. So this is the liver window. So uh, you can see those uh, those structures or those abnormalities in the liver, the clearest. Meanwhile, if there's any abnormality in the media sign, you can't really tell. Uh, any abnormality in other organs, you can't really tell, but the liver is the clearest. So this is the liver window. So you will focus the attenuation at the range closest to the liver. So we said that the soft tissue will be just above uh, zero, so it's above water, but it's not as high as bones. So you focus the attenuation closest to the liver window. The last one here, which window is this? Mm -hmm. This is the bone window. 
So uh, we we said the window is the where you can focus the most. So here you focus the most on the skull. You focus on the bones. So this is the bone window. So you have any fracture, any abnormality in the bones, you can see it the clearest. So that is it for windows. Now for contrast, we said we inject contrast to uh, improve um, the resolution. You can see structures more clearly. Which resolution is uh, is enhanced by contrast? Now, um, obviously from its name, but also when you think about it, when you inject contrast, you want to see it. You want to see different shades. So uh, different shades we said is related to contrast resolution. So IV iodinated contrast improves uh, contrast resolution. So um, you can see here um, these images. Which one has contrast? Is it the top one or the bottom one? Yes, the one down. Okay, wait, so here we have the question. Okay, I'll just repeat the windows uh, very fast. Come on. So the window, we said the window level is the center around which uh, images are displayed, and the width is the range of attenuation. We said if we increase the window width, you have a, a greater range of attenuation. So for example, if you have all this range, you can see all, many structures. So you can see the lungs, which are black. You can see the soft tissue. You can see the bones. You can see everything. But sometimes you need to focus at a specific window. So when you focus at a specific window, uh, you, will, um, you will be able to visualize structures at that level of attenuation. So uh, for example, I want to see the lungs. I don't need to see the bones. I don't need to see the soft tissue. I just want to focus on the lungs. I want to see, is there a tumor? Is there something going on? So you focus at the lung window. The lung window would have attenuation around negative 500, which is appropriate for the lung, for the air. So uh, for example, here we have the lung window. So if you have any abnormality in the in the lungs, you can see it. For example, fibrosis, any anything going on in dilation. So the, the lung will be clearest. Meanwhile, if you have abnormalities here, you can't really see them, you can't tell. So uh, this is the lung window. Here, abnormalities would be clear, uh, clearest in the mediastinum. But the lungs are not very clear. You can't really tell. The soft tissues, for example, you can't you can't tell that much. But here, the mediastinum is the clearest. So this is the mediastinal window. You focus the range of attenuation at that appropriate for the mediastinum. Here you have the liver window. So again, attenuation focused at that for the liver. So here, this is the liver window. But for example, the uh, other structures are not as clear as the liver. And finally, here you have the bone window because you can see the uh, see the bones the clearest. So any fracture in the bone will be clear. Any abnormalities in the soft tissue won't be that obvious. So this is the, the um, bone window. Um, here, do you have another question? Exposure to radiation is not affected too? Yes, here we're not talk talking about dose, uh, dose or uh, any exposure. We're just focusing at what attenuation. So we focus at the attenuation that's appropriate for the tissue or that's appropriate for the bone, but we're not uh, playing with the, do with the dose of the radiation itself. Tamam. Okay, all clear. Hans, we can continue. Tamam. So we said uh, contrast will help us with the, improving the contrast resolution. And uh, this is just an extra point. We said we ha if we have less uh, uh, voltage or less energy, we have better photoelectric effect. So the image will be clearer. And uh, But for the contrast resolution, it's improved with contrast. So for example, if you don't have contrast, you can see there is a vague abnormality in uh, here in the liver, for example. But adding contrast will make it brighter, so you can see. Now, how can you tell if this image has contrast or not? If there's no, if there's no abnormality, for example, what thing can you look at, and this will indicate that the uh, image, yes, does in fact have contrast? Does anyone know? Vessels, okay, close. Brightness of the bone, no, because uh, the contrast won't be taken up by the bone, but it will it will appear in the vessels, yes. But uh, the structure you you should look at is the aorta here. So the aorta, if it's dull, doesn't really have contrast. So the image has no contrast. But if the aorta is bright, if you look at the aorta and it's white, now aorta is is basically blood. So um, blood is not supposed to to look white. We said the bone has the highest attenuation, but if it looks bright like this, then the image has contrast. So here, the contrast will uh, will help you um, visualize the structures better. For example, any hemangioma in the liver, any tumor, the tumor will take up the contrast to appear, appear bright. So uh, yeah, that's the benefit of having contrast. 
And uh, you need to remember that the photoelectric effects will be better with, with iodine. We said the photoelectric effects will um, contribute to the image formation, which is the thing you want. So uh, if you have better photoelectric effect with iodine, this means that the image will be clearer. We will benefit more. And you have the K edge. Um, K edge is basically the abrupt increase in photoelectric absorption of X-ray photons. So here, if you have the uh, X-ray energy being absorbed, and then you suddenly have an abrupt increase, and uh, this is due to the photoelectric effect, which is just beyond the binding energy. We don't really have to go into uh, details. Just know that uh, you have a better photoelectric effect and uh, K edge at uh, for iodine at 33. Um, um, yeah, at 33, yes. So uh, that is it for contrast, I guess. Now we move to the radiation dose. Does anyone have a question about contrast? All good. We can move on to the next. Now for the radiation dose. We need to keep some things in mind when uh, when we want to talk about the dose in, uh, in CT or in, in, in any radiation. We talked about uh, milliampere, which is the current, which is basically the number of ele electrons. We talked about it previously. So the dose increases with increasing uh, electron or current. So uh, this is a linear relationship. So if you have uh, a doubling the current or doubling the number of electrons, you double the dose. This is a linear re relationship. Again, the tube on time, or basically the exposure time, the amount of time that the patient is uh, undergoing the CT is also a linear relationship. Doubling the time doubles the dose. Here you have the KVP or the energy. Again, we discussed this previously. We said this is an exponential relationship, not a linear relationship. So doubling the KVP or the voltage or the energy will give you four times the dose. So this will have a, a bigger effect than uh, increasing the current. So this will give you four times the dose by doubling the energy and will distort the image at the same time. Now the field, the field of view, Increasing the field of view by 10 centimeters gives you an increase in 10% of the dose. Again, this is also a linear relationship, as you can see. So increasing by 10 centimeters increase, increases the dose by 10%. So by that uh, logic, if you decrease the field of view, you will get less radiation exposure or a less dose. So you use a shutter to control the exposed area. Uh, so, uh, as we mentioned, when you when you want to screen the patient, you don't expose the whole patient to the radiation. You use a shutter, and then you control the amount of uh, area exposed, or in other words, the field of view. So, KVP is exponential, or the others are linear, linear relationship. So, that is it for the uh, radiation dose. Now, uh, we will move to the clinical applications of CT. But before uh, moving on to the diagnosis and the different things that, uh, that could happen, that could go wrong, uh, in the patient. Let's talk about the planes. So uh, here you have different planes. You can uh, have an uh, axial plane, you can have a sagittal plane, and a coronal plane. Now axial uh, plane means that you take a cross section of the body. So here, as you can see, this is the axial plane. So you see the, the body uh, by cutting across here, as you can see the blue line here. So you can see the liver, you can see the stomach, you can see all the other different organs. Here you have the spleen. Meanwhile, in a coronal plane or a frontal plane, you're cutting the body like this. So you will see everything from the front. So again, here you have the liver, um, here you have the heart above, here you have the diaphragm, here you have the small bowel, and then you have the bladder. So you're seeing everything on a coronal plane. And finally, you have the sagittal plane. Sagittal plane, where you cut across like this. So uh, sagittal plane is uh, pink here. And this is the sagittal plane. You can see the brain, you can see the skull. Um, so you have the coronal, you have the axial, you have the uh, sagittal plane. So we'll be looking at uh, images in different planes. Now, how do you choose the appropriate examination? You have a patient that presents to you and you need to examine them. How do you judge if you need an X-ray, if you need CT, if you need ultrasound and so on? So um, uh, this here, you can see, they the examination that was shown by the highest level of evidence available to answer the clinical question or diagnosing the problem with selected patient population. So different populations, we said, uh, um, can be exposed to different radiation, and it depends on the uh, in the case itself. So uh, we will be pre presenting some cases, and we'll uh, judge um, what is going wrong and what is the best modality. 
Uh, so um, again, radiology will help you uh, figure out if you need uh, medical intervention or surgical inter intervention, or the patient uh, just have to uh, just has to be observed with no intervention. Uh, so um, again, um, this is just for examination. You will first uh, define the clinical problem, the patient presentation. They have pain, fever, they have trauma, uh, because uh, different presentations require different uh, uh, interventions or different uh, diagnostic modalities. And then. You list the possible diagnosis, and then you uh, choose the appropriate radi radiology examination. Sometimes, um, uh, okay, first you need to choose the appropriate examination for the patient himself. So if the patient is pregnant, for example, you won't go for x-ray, you won't go for CT. You think of MRI, you, you think of ultrasound, you think of other stuff. Meanwhile, a patient presents with a fracture, and uh, let's say it's a 20-year-old, and he presents with a wrist, a wrist fracture. Uh, what do you do? You just need an X-ray and only for the hand. You don't. You don't need to do CT. You don't need to examine the whole body. But also, you need to keep in mind the urgency. So sometimes, let's say a patient presents with trauma. Now, trauma is something major. You need to test. You need to make sure there is no internal bleeding. You need to make sure everything in the, uh, is intact uh, internally. So you do a CT. Uh, we'll be going over that uh, briefly. But just for now, just keep in mind, uh, trauma is related to CT. But sometimes you need uh, to think of urgency. You need something really fast. So uh, if uh, if you suspect that the patient has a pneumothorax, for example, uh, for pneumothorax, you, uh, an X-ray would be available, and X-ray would help you figure out if the patient has a tension pneumothorax, and they will be struggling to breathe. And then you just need to, uh, to make sure that the, that the patient does not have a tension pneumothorax. Rule it out. So you do a uh, chest uh, uh, X-ray. But usually, in cases of trauma. You do um, uh, a pan CT, or ba basically you do a CT for the whole body to check everything is intact. There's no bleeding in internal organ, for example, laceration in the spleen, or there's inter internal hematoma, intracranial hematoma, and so on. So you have to uh, make uh, to keep in mind the availability, the patient himself, and the urgency of the situation. Now, when do you use CT? The main thing you have to keep in mind is trauma. So if the patient presents after a car accident, a motor vehicle accident, anything, if you see the, uh, the word accident, the first thing you should think of is CT. So uh, uh, here, uh, for example, let's say um, a 25-year-old was uh, driving and he was drunk. He hit the car and then uh, he was he presented the uh, ER. First thing you should do is a CT to check there is no, again, as, as we said, uh, any bleeding, any laceration in the internal organs and so on. And you also need the CT for the nervous system and for the brain. So if the patient suddenly presents of uh, a slurred speech, a headache, a loss of consciousness, what is the, the thing you first think of? First diagnosis to think of is stroke. So uh, they suddenly have a slurred speech, they lose consciousness, you think of stroke. For stroke, the best modality would be CT. Now, uh, also for, um, uh, for example, if you have... Um, uh, okay, for you, for stroke, for example, you have ischemic stroke, you have the hemorrhagic stroke, it can be, you have thrombus, embolus, and so on. So uh, different types of stroke, and also for bleeding. So if you have epidural hematoma, you have subdural hematoma, for all those, the best modality would be uh, CT. Yes. And uh, non-contrast, yes. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. We have we have a section about the hematomas. So, but for now, you just remember that trauma, CT, you have bleeding, you have stroke, also CT for respiratory. If a patient has acute or chronic cough, let's say a patient has chronic cough, they've been coughing for months. So, uh, you will you suspect COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. First modality or the best modality would be CT. Now, uh, for lung uh, for lung issues, as I said, for example, for tension pneumothorax, it can be detected by X-ray. X-ray can detect it, but you still need a CT to confirm the diagnosis. So CT is the best modality. Sometimes a patient, if a patient presents, you do X-ray first, but the best modality and the first thing you should think of is CT. Again, it can be used for GI. For example, if the patient has appendicitis or there's ischemia in internal organs, again, think of CT. And finally, for tumors. So uh, tumors, uh, best modality to uh, to see tumors. For example, let's say you have a tumor in the liver. As we said, you put at the liver window, you put contrast, and then uh, the contrast will be taken up by the tumor and it will light up so you can see it. So CT, uh, best modality for trauma, for uh, anything in the nervous system, COPD, GI, and for tumors. Exception, we talked about the exceptions in the previous section. We said, uh, when can't we use CT? 
For example, let's say uh, the patient is pregnant. Again, CT is, uh, is almost 100 times the radiation of X-ray. So uh, you can imagine if X-rays are bad for a pregnant woman, you can imagine the harm the CT can, co can cause. In some cases, if it's an emergency, uh, you don't really think about the harm. And then um, you just uh, following the justification rule by the I ICRP principle, you just uh, do it. But usually, if the patient is pregnant, if they're very young, you don't use CT because it's harmful. It's the ionizing radiation. Now, okay, we said CT uses attenuation or density. So uh, when you talk about the different attenuations, um, you, for example, let's uh, let's say in CTs compared to ultrasound, when do you say, um, uh, how do you describe the different shades? Do you say hyperdense, hyperintense, hyperechoic? How or how do you describe? When do you say hyperdense, for example? Hyperdense, hyperdense, isodense, and CT, yes. So uh, dense is the word you use for CT. So uh, a hyperdense, um, a hypodense, for example, will have lower attenuation than uh, um, a hyperdense object. When do we use hyperintense and hypointense? MRI, exactly. And when do we use hyperechoic, hypoechoic? Mm -hmm. Try again. Yes, ultrasound. Ultrasound, we use uh, hyperechoic, hypoechoic. Uh, you're thinking of echo because you have sound waves reflecting the sound. For MRI, you have intensity, so you have hyper intense, hypo intense. But uh, for CT, you think about you think about uh, density. So you have hyper dense or hyper attenuating compared to other organs. So for example, here. Um, do you see the aorta is very bright? So what can you tell about this image? Compared to this one, the aorta is dark. Here, yeah. aorta is very bright, is what? So what do you have in this image? Has contrast, exactly. So this is a CT contrast. And then here, anything going on in the liver? No, it looks, um, it looks homogenous. There is no difference, uh, difference in colors. As soon as you inject the IV contrast, it's taken up by the tumors because we know that tumors have uh, increased the arteries, increased the blood flow, so it will be taken up uh, by the tumor, and then it will start lighting up. So with contrast, you can tell there is something going on the, with the liver. It can either be tumors, it can be a hemangioma, so it depends. Remember how we said uh, there is a difference in um, the timing of the contrast? So here, uh, you have an arterial enhancing lesion, uh, so, which means that in the arterial phase, so at the beginning when you inject the contrast, uh, the vascular, the structures with high vascular supply will light up. For example, the tumors. So this is an arterial enhancing lesion. Now, uh, for example, hemangioma will light up later on. Uh, different uh, different structures will light up at different times. So it depends on the timing of the contrast at the same time. Okay. So Hartsfield scale, as we explained, is uh, basically the attenuation. So uh, here you have um, a high attenuation. So uh, for example, the bone will be uh, a high attenuating, uh, starting from 100 up to, you can even reach 1000. We said water is always zero, zero Hansfield units. And then the air will be closer to negative 500, negative 5000. So here you have low attenuation. Fat will be at negative 100, any, uh, less, uh, less than water, but still not as much as air. So it will appear dark. Meanwhile, soft tissue will appear uh, lighter gray, but not as much as uh, the cortical one. So this is just scale. Now again, CT with or without contrast. Now um, you can see these uh, areas that are supposed to be full of fluid are usually not as bright, but as soon as you inject contrast, they will appear uh, brighter. Now this is a brain CT. Now, since you guys are taking neuro, you're supposed to know the different uh, structures in the brain. Where do you see the white matter and where do you see the gray matter? Yes. Okay, we got one white center, gray surrounding, white center. Yes. So uh, the, the center will be white. And then uh, compared to the gray matter, will, will it be less attenuation or high attenuation?
Okay. So in the center, you have the white matic. Then outside, you have the gray matic. And then you have the different structures. What do you guys uh, see here? What is this black thing? Yes, the ventricles. So those, those are the ventricles. And now what are those lines you see? What are those lines? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You have the gyri and the sulci. So uh, these are uh, these are all brain CTs, but are taken at different sections. So this uh, you can see here the eyes, the, the nose. So this is taken at a different section than this, for example, where you can see the brain. And here uh, I added an image with the different structures. So here um, you see the internal capsule, the caudate nucleus, the putamen, everything. This is all left for neuro. We want to talk about it for now. Just fo focus on the um, radiology aspect. Uh, but you can just look at those if you want to know more about the, the radiology. Now you have a young versus old brain. What differences can you see? So this is a brain of an elderly. What differences can you see? Can you tell me in the chat? Okay, sarcai so bigger, ventricles are bigger, wider ventricles. Yes, good job. Okay, so you have different uh, things going on when, when a patient ages. So, uh, for example, if a patient has Alzheimer's or if the patient is older, uh, you have uh, the brain structure obviously won't stay the same. So here you can see face, the biggest change you can see is the ventricles. So here, here the ventricles you can see are uh, getting larger. The brain will be shrunken and then the sulci will be larger. So uh, here you have the enlarged sulci, you have the large uh, ventricles, you have the shrinking of the brain itself. So, so all those changes happen when the patient grows older. Okay, here we have a first case. A young gentleman uh, with acute and onset headache. Here, um, this is the normal one for your comparison, and this is the patient. Can you guys diagnose? What do you think is going on? Hello? We got some arachnoid hemorrhage. Do you guys agree? The pedura? Some arachnoids? Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so uh, for all those of you who said subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay, you're correct. So the diagnosis here is subarachnoid hemorrhage. What is the main presentation of the patient? So the patient will come complaining of what? You guys are supposed to take this in your Did you take it or not yet? Yes, worst headache of their life. The patient will come complaining of the worst headache of their life. This is a big red flag for subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you have, so uh, remember when we said uh, the different cases where you have to do a CT, we said for the nervous system, you will think of uh, CT when the patient has loss of consciousness, uh, stirred speech, and also if they have a headache. The worst headache of their life, uh, describing subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this um, acute onset will, uh, will require a CT. And this is an in indicator for subarachnoid hemorrhage. And what is the cause? There are different causes. It can be for a ruptured aneurysm. And what is the sign in CT? So here in uh, these extra axis spaces, you see uh, will be whiter, increased in density. They will be hyper uh, hyper dense. And uh, uh, usually sometimes they describe it as spider shaped. So this is an indication uh, or indicator that this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So whenever you see this, Think of subarachnoid hemorrhage together with the patient presentation. He's young, has acute onset of the worst headache of his life. Tama, what do you see in this case? Mm -hmm. And you something? Epidurals? Edema. Tamam. 
Okay, whoever said epidural, can you explain this? Epidural hemorrhage with specific shape and CT. Okay, it's coming up. So we'll explain epidural hemorrhage in, in yes, convex shape or lemon shape. Do you see anything convex in this image? There's nothing convex. So this is not epidural hemorrhage. This is sign number one. Sign number two, when we describe hemorrhage, when you give contrast, it's supposed to light up. It's supposed to be bright. Then you have darkness. So there is less blood supply. So in this case, you think about um, ischemia. You think about edema before giving contrast and so on. So yes, stroke. You we think of stroke. Now we have two types of stroke. You have ischemic stroke and... Um, uh, you have, uh, for example, cytotoxic edema, and you have a uh, vasodilatic edema. There are different types of stroke happening here. Uh, so here, do you think this is cytotoxic or vasogenic edema? Cytotoxic? Cytotoxic? Okay. Tamam. So here, you have low attenuation. It's not appearing bright. You have loss of differentiation between the gray and the white matter. We said the gray matter is outside, the white matter is uh, inside. Now, you have loss of differentiation between them. Can you see any uh, um, like a specific border between the gray and the white matter? There's a loss of differentiation. There's low attenuation. So this is a sign of cyt cytotoxic edema. So here you have an infarction. So what, what is happening in infarction? You have loss of blood supply to a certain area. So there is edema. Here, in this case, this is cytotoxic edema because you can't see any differentiation between the gray and the white matter. So in this case, what do we have? Ischemic stroke. So the patient with a stroke will, stroke will, uh, appear, uh, will they come with slurred speech. Uh, they will have, um, um, again, headache plus any. The worst headache of their life is uh, um, poor subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here you have a patient coming with slurred speech and so on. Uh, and on X-ray, on CT, sorry, you'll see loss of differentiation. This is cytotoxic edema due to infarction, for example. Here in uh, which territory? This is supplied by which artery? You took the blood supply, صح? Right? Yes, MC8. So this is the MC8 territory. There is an infarction there. This, co this caused an, an ischemic stroke. Tamam. In this case, what do you see? Which type of edema? Is this the same as the previous case or a different one? Different. Which, uh, which type? Do you know the name? Vasogenic edema. So in this case, you have no loss of differentiation between the gray and the white matter. You can still see the gyri, the sulci, the gray matter, white matter. And like here, where everything was just black. So here you can see, you can still see, uh, but there is a surrounding hypodensity and you have something here in the middle. So this can be, again, due to an aneurysm, can be a tumor, it can be anything, uh, abscess or tumor. And here you have vasogenic edema. So in vasogenic edema, you have no loss of differentiation between the gray and the white matter. You have surrounding hypodensity, and here you have uh, the uh, area where the problem is. Can be an abscess, can be a tumor, it can be aneurysm. So it depends on the case. So here, which uh, type of stroke is this? Hemorrhagic stroke. So in hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke, the patient presents and you suspect a stroke. Uh, first thing you need to do is a CT. Do you use contrast or do you not use contrast? Someone mentioned this before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you suspect a stroke, you do CT without contrast because you need to check if the patient, uh, if the patient has a stroke first. If you suspect a stroke because uh, they will be bleeding, you can't use uh, CT because you, you won't be able to, uh, you can't use contrast because you can't tell anything. So you do CT without contrast first to rule out any ischemic stroke. So uh, uh, ischemic stroke can be, um, for example, due to an embolus or something that caused an infarction. Uh, here, hemorrhagic stroke can be an abscess or tumor. Uh, so uh, here, 
for this case, do you think it's an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke? You can still tell uh, the sulci, the gyri, you can tell the white matter, gray matter, or is everything weird? Mm -hmm. You got hemorrhagic stroke? What does, what do you guys think? Yes, it is a hemorrhagic stroke. So this is a hemorrhagic stroke. We said in uh, ischemic stroke, you have uh, loss of differentiation and um, this image here. Loss of differentiation, and maybe due to infarction. Here in this case, uh, the MCA territory. Here, uh, you have uh, surrounding hypodensity. There is hypodensity, but again, there's no loss of differentiation, just like this case. Okay, again, this is another image. So you can see this is the same image as here. But then when you added contrast, you can see the this is the problem area. This is basically this maybe an aneurysm, for example. And then uh, it caused the hemorrhagic stroke, which is the vasogenic edema here. Tamam, now tell me, what do you see here? Mm -hmm. Now this is an epidural hematoma. So uh, this is an epidural hematoma. Again, for hematoma, using the brain, uh, the best modality is CT. Now, specific characteristics of epidural hematoma. This can be caused by traumatic injury. Now, uh, for example, um, let's say a patient got into um, an accident again and hit his head. There will be doctor of what exactly? Can anyone tell me what can lead to epidural hematoma? You study this, sir. Right? Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, middle meningeal. So if the middle meningeal bursts, it will give you epidural hematoma. It will look lens-shaped or lemon-shaped, and it does not cross the fissures. The fissures of the skull will not be crossed in epidural hematoma. Meanwhile, in subdural hematoma... Okay, middle... Okay, subdural hematoma, let's look at this. So subdural hematoma would look banana shaped, so it's concave, uh, crescent shaped, and here this is uh, caused by rupture of the bridging veins. And so you, uh, usually seen and elderly if they slip and fall, hit their head. This is the most basic case you can get. Uh, this is a subdural hematoma, and sub for banana, banana shaped, and it can cross the uh, uh, fissures. In one epidural hematoma, it looks lens shaped, convex, uh, rupture of the middle meningeal artery. Do you have a lucid interval? Um, you guys know what the dose of interval is, so anyone tell me in the chat? This is just a quick neuro review. Yes, patient doesn't feel symptoms after some time. So basically, the patient hit their head, fall unconscious, then wake up as if um, and nothing happened. They don't have any symptoms. Then the, the the patient will deteriorate again. So this is epidural hematoma, epi, pi, lemon pi. So you remember this uh, this presentation. Tamam, just CT. Okay. So remember what we said about windows. Now, can you tell me which window is this? First image. We got lung, we got mediastinal, chest, lung again, bone. Hmm. Okay, uh, so whoever said lung here, if you if there is any abnormality in the lung, if there is dilation in the bone clothes, for example, can you see it? Can you see them? Can you tell them? So this can't be the lung window. So if there is any abnormality in the, um, yes, exactly, mediastinal window. So here you can see the mediastinal. So if there's any abnormality in the uh, in the aorta, in the vessels, and anything in the heart, so you, you will be able to tell because you focused on those. But in the lung window, uh, you you will be able to see the specifics of the lung. So let's talk about the this image. Which window is this? Okay, now this is the lung window. Yes. 
So you can see, uh, you can see the bronchioles, you can see the tiny, tiny things. Any abnormality in the lung will be clear. So this is the lung window. Which window is this? Again, lung window, yes. So the difference between those is the plane. We said we have sagittal plane, we have axial plane, we have coronal plane. So um, uh, this is just different planes, but both are the lung window. This one is the mediastinal window. So here, um, okay, just CT. Now the patient here is a middle-aged woman with shortness of breath for a few, a few hours. Diagnosis. Looking at those images. Can you guys tell? We got two pulmonary embolism, embolism. Tamam. Yes, good job. So this is an embolism. Here, you, you can see this saddle-shaped structure. This thing is basically an embolus. So here you have a diagnosis pulmonary embolism. A, a cause is the thrombus. For example, a deep vein thrombosis that mobilized and then it got stuck in the pulmonary arteries. Then it will give us this shape. Now here you can't see it. Can you tell me the difference between those two? Can anyone tell me why can you see it here? You can't see it here and why? Okay, not about the time. Yes, about the contrast. So how can you know the... Yes, so this image has contrast. This one does not have contrast. How can you tell? Looking at the aorta again. So here you can see this aorta it looks dark. It looks bright. So here you have contrast. Contrast will, uh, will fill up all those vessels. And now, if the contrast is filling up the vessels, it's supposed to look like this. So it's filling normally. Thus, here you have filling defects. So you can see it's not filling everything. There's something stuck in there. So this will tell you there is a pulmonary embolism. So the patient has shortness of breath, indicating there's a problem with the lungs. Uh, so now, uh, or the breathing, you need the airways. So now you try to think. Uh, you diagnose a pulmonary embolism. Tamam. Next one. Here. Short of breath for a few hours, but you have this CT. Absolute fusion. Okay. What do you guys say? Others? Pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Any more answers? Pneumonia. Tamam. Okay, so we have a bunch of things going on in this patient. So, let's look at this. Here, the patient has many things going on. Um, it can be caused by infection, and uh, the main diagnosis is pneumonia, but you have several things going on. So, let's look at the structures. Here, we have the heart. Here, we have the aorta. We have the lungs, and we have the bones here, the vertebra and all those bones. So, this one is the normal appearance. So it's, it's supposed to look at a low attenuation. It's looking dark. So this is the normal lung. And the lung is, is uh, covered by something. What do we call the covering of the lung? Fluid, yes. Uh, okay, someone asked, could this be pneumothorax? No, in pneumothorax, what happens is you have penetration, and then air will be surrounding the lungs and the lung will shrink. In this case, um, you can't really see, see it. And we said for pneumothorax, usually if, the, if you suspect the patient has tension pneumothorax, you do an X-ray, not a CT. So in this case, you do you did a CT and you see all those abnormalities. Uh, you have different attenuations, different things going on. In pneumothorax, it's mainly air. It's um, So air is supposed to look dark. It won't look different shades of gray here. Okay, so yes, uh, we said the lung is surrounded by uh, the pleura. So here you can see the pleura. And can you compare it to this one? The pleura here is very thickened. So you have thick pleura. Uh, so um, here uh, you have pleuritis. This is one of the, uh, the many things going on in this patient. You have pleuritis, pleural thickening. You have pleural effusion again, as someone mentioned in the chat. You have pleural effusion because uh, there is fluid build building up inside the pleura. And look at the lung. The lung looks um, very weird, basically. There is consolidation, so there is darkness going on. It's uh, I mean, there's different colors going on instead of looking black. 
So there is an abnormality in the lung, due, usually due to infection. So here you have pneumonia, you have pleuritis, thickening in the pleura, you have pleural effusion, there are many things going on. Okay, next one. Here. Main abnormality will be, as you can see here, so what do you call this? What's happening here? Fluid build up, okay. So what do you call this? Fluid effusion, tank. So here you have fluid effusion, which is fluid accum accumulation within the pleural. So this is, uh, uh, so here you have some fluid uh, uh, accumulation within the pleura, but here you have much more. Also, one thing I forgot to mention, which one is the right side and which one is the left? When you're looking, looking at it, is it just like you're looking out? Yes, exactly. Your right is the left. So here, this, here, opposite, exactly. So this will be the right, this will be the left. So here, the right, there is more right pleural effusion than the left. So whenever you're looking at, uh, at a CT, uh, remember that the uh, sides are flipped. Here you have the right, here you have the left. Um, the same, same thing in an X-ray, same thing in others. And you're looking at the patient from the left side, not from the head side. So the patient is lying down. Imagine you're standing at the left side and the the uh, directions are flipped. So here you have the right, here you have the left. So here you have more right pleural fusion than the left. So now adrenal CT. Here, which plane is this? Um, not window, I'm asking about the plane. Axial, frontal, sagittal, so on. Mm -hmm. Coronal plane. So, so this is a coronal plane. So uh, here, uh, the structure here is the liver. Here you have the vertebrae. Here you have the uh, the iliopsoas muscles, and uh, here you have the start of the femur. Here you have the iliac crust, and so on. And we'll focus on the kidneys. You have the little triangles here. Those little triangles are the adrenal glands. And on CT, um, again, you can see anything above the kidney. Those are the adrenal glands. And here, here again, you can see the adrenal gland. Um, again, uh, as we know, the right kidney will be pushed lower than the left kidney because of the liver. So here you can see the top of the adrenal. Um, okay. And uh, here, look at this. This is supposed to be an adrenal gland, but something is happening here. What do you think is going on? Mass, yes. Okay. Okay, tumor, mass, tunnel. So here it's a uh, low attenuating. Uh, it's low attenuating. So we have, if we have lower attenuation, we set uh, in the range of the uh, Hounsfield units, in the range of attenuations, um, you have the you know, maximum at the cortical bone, the, the white, and then you have the minimum or the lowest attenuation in the air. So you have lower attenuation towards the air side, but it's not as dark as the air. At which level? So that would be closer to the fat. So here you have fat containing mass because it's low attenuating. It's not as much as air. It's not completely black, but it's low attenuation. So it's usually fat containing mass. So this is usually called an adenoma or a lipoma. So adenoma or a lipoma in the adrenal glands will look like this. So it's a low attenuating mass. Now let's look at this. Here you have an X-ray and a CT. When you look at this, okay, this image is very, uh, but uh, you can tell that here you have the kidneys, here you have something bright. And then looking at the CT, uh, again, uh, here, let's look at this way. You can see something bright. What is this? Mm -hmm. We got stone. What do the others think? Do you agree with that? Yes, tamam. So we call this urolithiasis, as you can see on the slide. So it's basically a kidney stone. So here you have a renal stone and a hydronephrosis. And for a renal stone, you use a CT without contrast. Again, because the stone is a solid structure. So uh, the it will appear bright, as you can see here. It will appear bright, just like the bone. So if you add a contrast, then it will fill the vessels. Everything will appear bright. And you can't really see the stone uh, anymore. So uh, when, you, when you're suspecting a stone, 
we do a CT without contrast, and then it will light up like this here on an X-ray, here on a CT. And we also have hydronephrosis. What is hydronephrosis? Can you tell me? Built up. So fluid is uh, backing up and building up in the kidney, ca causing hydronephrosis. So this is uh, here another image. Okay, again, because the image, uh, the size is maximized, uh, they don't look that clear. As you can see, there is fluid built up in the kidney. It doesn't look normal anymore. So this again, um, uh, you have hydronephrosis. And here we can see the bright structure. This bright structure is the stone. And behind it, you have here a posterior shadowing. Now, did you guys take any ultrasound lectures or not yet? Let me see the thing. Last year, tamam. So you guys will take ultrasound in the post midterm lectures. Uh, for our batch, we had ultrasound in the pre midterm. But uh, what you need to remember is, tamam. In uh, ultrasound, you either have a posterior uh, enhancement or acoustic uh, acoustic enhancement or posterior shadowing. So here, in this case, uh, you have the stone in the kidney. Behind the stone, you, you see a shadow. So this tells you that the structure here is a solid structure. It's not fluid filled. So the solid structure would be a stone. So here in this case, when you do an ultrasound and you see posterior shadowing, you know that this is the stone. So uh, when you suspect a stone, you do a CT. First thing, you do a CT. Because if you do an ultrasound, you can see here the stone is um, a hyperechoic because in ultrasound we said we use hyperechoic, hypoechoic and with posterior shadowing. So this is for urinary flasses. Now, uh, in this case, you can see uh, CT and again, the sound. So here, um, what do you see? Enlargement. Adrian process. Other answers? Fluid buildup also. So, okay, so uh, cancer. Okay. So cancer is a solid mass. So on ultrasound, do you think the cancer would look black or would it look bright? Even on CT, it wouldn't look this dark as you can see. So here. This this black thing is fluid buildup. So this fluid is basically hydronephrosis, and cancer would look very ir irregular. So uh, it look it would look lobulated. It won't look this smooth. So here you have fluid buildup in the kidneys. Again, this is hydronephrosis. So uh, hydronephrosis. Do you do CT or ultrasound? And uh, the patient is presenting. So when do you know when to do a CT or when to do an ultrasound? Let's say. Okay, we have some in chat. Okay, yeah. And then hydronephrosis. So let's say the patient presents with sudden pain and it's uh, going loin to groin. So what are you suspecting here in this case? CT, okay. So in this case, if the patient comes with acute onset pain and it's uh, loin to groin, you're suspecting a kidney stone. And the best modality for kidney stones is CT. So you do a CT with or without, without contrast. Can you tell me in the chat? Without contrast, yes. So you do CT without contrast when you suspect a stone. Now, patient presents with chronic pain. So the pain uh, has been going on for the, for quite some time and it's getting more intense. So you don't suspect a stone because a stone getting lodged will cause acute pain and it will go usually uh, going to bring. But uh, if, it's, uh, if it's going on for some time and it's getting worse, so you're suspecting fluid is backing up and it's... Um, um, basically building up in the kidney, suspecting hydronephrosis. So you do an ultrasound first. On ultrasound, you'll see this. This will confirm uh, the hydronephrosis. And then you can still do a CT later on and you'll see this presentation. But if you do a, ki a kidney, if you suspect a kidney stone, again, you can still see it on an ultrasound, but the best modality of choice, CT.
CT without contrast. So here in this case, again, this is an, an ultrasound and you still see something, but behind it or underneath it, you see enhancement. Now you guys didn't take ultrasound yet, but uh, what you need to remember is, remember how I told you, um, if you have a structure on ultrasound and then you look behind it or under it, it can either have a shadow or it can have enhancement. Okay. Um, what can cause hydronephrosis other than stone? Okay, there are different conditions. Um, you have different infections. You have different uh, things going on that can cause hydronephrosis. It doesn't have. It doesn't necessarily have to be a stone. But, uh, but for this lecture's sake, this lecture's sake, just have to remember that a stone. Uh, best modality is CT without contrast. Hydronephrosis, whatever the cause is, uh, it will be more chronic, so the patient won't present suddenly with the pain. And uh, in that case, we'll go with uh, ultrasound. Uh, is CT better in public area or stone in general? Um, I don't understand the question. Better in public area. Oh, you mean uh, for pelvis in general? Yes, remember when you said uh, the general, um, like the different conditions where you, you where you would go for a CT? So the main thing is the trauma. You do pan CT for everything to check that there's no lacerations anywhere, bleeding anywhere uh, for the nervous system and for GI. So anything in the GI, the kidneys, including the GI in, in the pelvis, for example. Usually CT is the modality of choice. But uh, for different conditions, you have uh, you need different indications. So, for example, uh, pelvis, we said, okay, uh, CT is a modality of choice. And especially for stones, modality of choice would be CT. Again, for hydronephrosis, uh, you can see it on CT, but you'll first go for an ultrasound. And um, also keeping in mind the patient's condition, is the patient very young, he was pregnant, what's going on, and so on. So here in this case, you still see something, but behind it, you don't have a shadow. You have enhancement. It looks brighter. It looks hyperechoic, although the thing itself is anechoic, so it looks dark. So can this be a stone? Is this a stone? Yes, no. doesn't look like it okay so this is not a stone remember we said a stone um yeah. Yeah. this is the stone behind it you'll have a shadow you see a shadow so uh, it will look hyper echoic and the shadow uh, behind it will indicate that this is a kidney stone so here you have urolithiasis but in this case you see uh, you have something dark, and then behind that you have posterior enhancement. Now, when you take ultrasound, you'll understand this in better detail, but this is basically um, a cyst. So a cyst is uh, a collection of fluid. So you have something full of fluid, and the fluid will give you, when you, uh, when you use the ultrasound, it will give you an enhancement behind it. So a cyst will have posterior enhancement, while the uh, kidney stone will have posterior shadowing. So here you can see the cyst again. This is the cyst, the cyst, an ultrasound, you can see it with the same enhancement. Okay, so you can see here there's something irregular. And you can, uh, if you look at the CT here, this is the left kidney. This whole thing is the right kidney. So there is so much going on. And does it look homogenous? Does it look uh, one color? Or does it have different specks of colors? And what do you think the diagnosis is? Different, okay. Mass. Are there any other answers? Cis. Mass. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, for whoever said cyst, this is what a cyst looks like. Cyst is usually benign, it's not something malignant. So it will look uniform, it's small, it's dark, and it's full of fluid, so it won't look um, bright. And uh, on ultrasound, it will have posterior, posterior enhancement. On uh, CT, here you can see it's dark and small. Meanwhile, here you can see uh, it's very huge, very big. It has different colors, different shades. So you can see here it's uh, um, a light gray, here it's dark gray, 
So there is something wrong going on. They, this cannot be benign. So here in this case, I have a solid mass. And this can be renal cancer. Here again, a cyst will have posterior, uh, posterior enhancement. You don't see anything white coming out here. And there's no shadows. It's not a stone. So they, this is a solid mass. A solid mass could be renal cancer. Now let's look. We're done with the kidneys. Uh, do you have any question about the previous section here? Any questions or fear? Okay. Tamam. Next section. Tamam. Here. What is the plane we're looking at? Which plane is this? Okay, sagittal plane. Okay, bone. Yes, uh, bone. Uh, this is the window. So we have the window bone and the, in the sagittal plane. Tamam. Okay, so this is the normal CT where you can see the bones. And this is our patient. Do you see anything abnormal here? Yes, exactly. So here we have cervical spine factor. So this is the cervical spine. This is, I think, at C6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is C6. Here you have a fracture in the cervical spine. You can see it's broken uh, from the vertebra. And here is the normal patient. So here the broken bits will be the fracture. Let's CT. Again. Uh, when you do a head CT, this this time, this is not a sagittal plane, this is an axial plane. So uh, there's a trauma to the skull. Uh, we said trauma. So what is the modality of choice? CT, yes. Okay. Uh, so which uh, window is this? We said this is the bone window. Uh, here, um, because you can see the bones very clearly. This, can you see the brain? Can you see the other structures? You can't really tell. So this is not a soft tissue window. This is the bone window. And you can you can see the fracture here and it's uh, due to trauma uh, leading to skull fracture. Just CT. Which window is this? Hmm? Yes, this is the long window. So uh, can you tell me what is going on? Can anyone diagnose? Mm -hmm. What was this? Yes, good job. Tamam. So here you have fibrosis going on. How is the OPD? Yes. Okay, so you have both. So here, this is the long window. You have the abnormality in the parenchyma. You have COPD and fibrosis. Uh, so um, here, okay. Um, the patient has both COPD and fibrosis, and how can we tell? This is just extra. Uh, we took this in third year CVP, but um, any, it's good to know uh, for now. So COPD will have uh, thickened airways, and so you can see the airways are much thicker than they uh, usually should be. And in fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, we'll see honeycomb. Lung. So you know what the honeycomb looks like? So you can see the lungs will look like uh, honeycombs. So this indicates fibrosis. And thickening in the airways indicates uh, COPD chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So the patient, the patient here has both. So it has uh, COPD, bronchiectasis, uh, fibrosis, because you can see the honeycombs. So everything is going on in this patient. Again, lungs is here. What do you think is going on? What do you see? You see anything abnormal? I got carcinoma, I got emphysema, tumor. Tumor. Mass, yes. So we said if the patient complains of anything in the respiratory system, there is a chronic cough, anything, the, uh, the modality of choice would be CT. CT will give you more details. Now, if you look at this x ray, you can tell there is something abnormal. There is a mass, there is something going on. Thus, you can't tell where exactly it is and what is going on. If you look at the CT, on the other hand, you can see this huge mass. So this thing is cancer. 
So the, the patient has lung cancer here. So X-ray can detect, but the CT is to confirm and locate. So if the patient presents, and uh, let's say the patient is a smoker, and you suspect there's something uh, mild going on only, they do it in an X-ray, you see an abnormality. And then this abnormality, now you suspect there is an, uh, there is cancer going on. So you do a CT to confirm. But usually the modality of choice for anything in the lungs, the respiratory system, again, would be uh, CT. And this CT will show you this mass. This mass is basically the lung cancer. So, yep, just what is going on? That's it. Mm -hmm. There is a traumatic injury and there is a blackness surrounding the lungs. So again, pneumothorax can happen to any trauma. Uh, for example, something will burst the lungs and uh, the pleura, for example, and you will have this blackness surrounding the lungs. So again, this is the lung window. Because you can't really see the mediastinum, you can't tell any abnormalities in the bones, but you can see the lungs very clearly. So you can see all those airways, you can see everything, the tissue. So uh, the lungs, uh, this is, I mean, this is the lung window. And this is the normal lung. But here you can see blackness surrounding the lung, as I explained earlier. Blackness of uh, air, air surrounding the lungs, means there is doom thorax. Modality is CT and can be picked up uh, by X-ray tool. So if... Um, when do we say we want to go for X-ray, not a CT? If the patient is uh, deteriorating and you need something fast, and uh, what's, and the patient presents to the ER and you need something fast, you won't take them to the CT room and take time, prepare the patient, and uh, scan the patient. CT will be long. Although CT, CT is a lot of choice for the radiological examination, but remember we said you have to keep in mind the urgency. So it can be picked up by X-ray too. There will be blackness around the lung, and the lung will look shrunken. Uh, but here you can also pick it up in CT and on X-ray. So this can be due to uh, a pa patient has uh, had trauma uh, to the chest and suddenly can't breathe. So this is usually pneumothorax. Abdomen. Now we also said one of the indications for using CT is um, um, yeah any abnormalities in the GI. Now for example, in the abdomen. So here, what do you think? Um, can they bring images from outside slides? They can, they can get from outside the slides. It doesn't have to be from the lectures themselves, but they're usually clear. And they're usually not very confusing. And you can tell if um, if you followed whatever I explained and how you can tell if this is a cyst, if this is a solid mass, if uh, you have cancer, you have fibrosis, yeah, there are different signs. So it, it doesn't have to be exactly from the lecture, but uh, if you can tell those signs, you can tell First, which window we're looking at, and then you look at the specific examples, you can tell. Okay, someone said appendicitis for this. Do you guys all agree? Agree. Okay. So, uh, remember how we said when we, uh, when we want to look at a CT and analyze it? We need to remember that we're looking at the patient from the left side, not from the head side, and the sides are flipped. So this is the right side, this is the left side. So here you have abnormality in the right side. You can see there is inflammation going on, so it looks brighter. So inflammation in this side, which is the appendix, will mean appendicitis. So you have thickened outline uh, of uh, the appendix, and the patient, patient will present of a uh, bright lower quadrant pain. So if the patient has this presentation, you do a CT because something in the abdomen, something in the GI. So CT is the modality of choice. So you do the CT, you look at this, and you find this inflammation, thickened outline. So this is uh, um, appendicitis. So modality is CT. And CT is used for anything in the GI. So it can be for gastroenteritis, for inflammatory bowel disease, for stones, and so on. So CT is a modality of choice in GI again. We're done with everything about the CT. So we'll have questions, but if you guys have any questions for me first, please ask me and then we'll move on to the questions. Any questions? All clear? 
تمام all good يلا questions which of the following increases the resolution in a CT contrast Okay, I tell them, I think I should have specified in the question. So you have uh, you have either contrast resolution or spatial resolution. So for contrast resolution, yes, you have um, C, which is ideal contrast. For spatial resolution, on the other hand, what would be the answer? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So here, um, this is my fault. I should have specified in the question. A spatial resolution would be low KV because you decrease uh, the uh, voltage, decrease the energy, you'll get a better resolution. And um, with contrast resolution, uh, the answer, yes, would be C, which is ideal contrast. Now, which of the following is true regarding spatial resolution and CT? Yes, the correct answer is me, influenced by the size of the focal spot. So uh, we said if the size is bigger in the detector, it won't, uh, it won't see any gap between the uh, objects. So you can't really get a good spatial resolution. And it's influenced by the size of focal spot. So if you have a smaller focal spot, you get better uh, spatial resolution. Next question. At A. Come on. The next answer is A. So the window level on B is equal to negative 500. Uh, which window is this? Long window. So the attenuation will be closer to the lung or the air, which is negative 500. Attenuation coefficient on B uh, compared to A. should be lower, not higher, because um, um, the attenuation for air is negative 500. Hey, this, uh, which window is this? Can anyone tell me? What can you see? Right. OK, so this is a media standard window. So the attenuation coefficient will be for the soft tissue. Soft tissue will be closer to uh, 40, for example. So, it will, so A is higher than B. Image A is acquired using electron beam technology. No, because uh, this is CT. So what do we utilize in CT? X-rays, exactly. We, so we use X-rays. And um, uh, finally, image A is acquired without IV contrast. We said this is with IV contrast because you can see the aorta here bright and clear. So this is with IV contrast. OK. An X-ray uh, showed a suspected kidney stone. What's the next step? Mm -hmm. CT without contrast, yes, because we said the contrast will blur out everything. Everything will look white. You can't see anything. Suspected kidney stone, CT without contrast. Next question. 53-year-old female complaining of abdominal pain. CT of the abdomen and pelvis was performed. What is the most likely diagnosis of abnormality inside the red box? I don't know this. Do you guys agree?
and says, Gina Cassie, remember what we said about hydronephrosis? Hydronephrosis is a buildup of fluid. So, uh, a buildup of fluid won't look uh, like it has different attenuations. So, um, when we have hydronephrosis, it will appear all black, or all the same color, and uh, it will look in, uh, in large space because of the buildup, obviously. But in case of renal cancer, do you remember what we said about cancer? Uh, cancer will have different attenuations. So you, you see it's speculated. So it will have a different colors, different shades inside the, the uh, structure. So here you have uh, the kidney. You can see there's renal cancer. Meanwhile, in the case of hydronephrosis, let's go back to the slide. Hydronephrosis. Here, you can see it looks all black. It looks homogenous. There are no different colors uh, going on. And on an ultrasound, it will look the same. So, next question. Do you guys understand why this is renal cancer? Yes. So. Next question. Sixty-sixty old gentleman presents with right-sided body weakness. Completed tomography of the head was performed. What is the most likely diagnosis? Again, this is a stroke. Because at the presentation of the patient. You have uh, body, uh, the right side of body weakness and um, basically slurred speech. All those will be indication uh, indicators that the patient is having a stroke. And then if you have um, darkness, yes, loss of differentiation. You have loss of differentiation between the white matter and the gray matter. You can see the sulca and the gyri and everything. So this is an ischemic stroke. Meanwhile, in a hemorrhagic stroke, and um, for example, if you have a hemorrhagic stroke, if you have... Um, let's say abscess or tumor, there will be no loss of differentiation. There will just uh, be any uh, hypodensity around the structure. And um, this will indicate um, visgenic stroke, um, visgenic edema. So next patient. So uh, here it's a 35 year old male, uh, motor vehicle accident, is unconscious, intubated, and there are reduced breath sounds on the left lung. So the patient can breathe. Plus, so the patient C D Okay, for you. <laughs> so let's say this is the question you got in the exam. What do you do? Put patient stable or urgent? This is the presentation. Um, we said if motor vehicle accidents to CT play up other people are saying play but it's urgent okay. <laughs> so, I had so much fun with putting this question I I asked so many people because we got this question in our exam and nobody to this day knows the answer. So I'll ask different people. Here is the first person I asked. And uh, we were discussing this question and we came to the conclusion that we should just skip the question because nobody knows the answer. And then I asked another person who's supposed to do much about radiology. So again, we asked, we discussed. People say D, 
people say C. Some people say uh, that yes, this is a motor vehicle accident. You need to do a pan CT. You need to check everything. Because again, you need to do a C, which is new, uh, which is X-ray or new works. And finally, I showed my friends this question and we remembered it from our exam. And till this day, nobody knows the answer. We still don't know. It may be um, a CT because it's um, because it's a motor vehicle accident. X-ray if it's pneumothorax. So in conclusion, uh, the question should be clear. The question should show that if the patient is stable and uh, they've presented after trauma, then we need to do a CT. Give CT or who unconscious. Okay, so even if it's unconscious, then this does not mean he doesn't uh, he shouldn't get a CT. Tamam. So yeah, uh, basically, um, for this question, if the patient is uh, in a critical condition and it's urgent, uh, so you do an X-ray to rule out pneumothorax first, and then after managing the pneumothorax, you move on to uh, helping the patient. Uh, you do a CT, you uh, do a fan CT for everything to check that the internal organs are all functioning well. Uh, there's no internal bleeding, no laceration to certain organs. But if the patient is, uh, uh, if you're not suspecting attention pneumothorax, first thing you do when you see trauma, you see a motor vehicle accident, you see trauma, think of CT first. So that was it for CT. We finished section two out of three. And then we left with uh, Dr. Hazaifa's part. So uh, uh, would you like to take a short break and then we move to the last section? Or should we just go on? I have two more lectures. Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break. Come back and uh, finish the last section, shall we? So now uh, we're back in the last section. Uh, basically, Dr. Hazaifa's lectures, which are the contrast and patient preparation. Now, I'll just give a disclaimer in the beginning. Uh, the lectures are pretty much self-explanatory and um, they're basically memorizing. So there is not much to, uh, to dig into detail in those lectures, but we'll explain them nonetheless. So let's start. So iodine containing contrast medium. So we talked about uh, iodine and contrast and it's used, for example, in CT. And we said it would enhance our contrast resolution. Uh, so now let's talk about the contrast itself. So this contrast can either be given as IV or oral or a tube. So uh, basically it can be given IV to the veins or it can be uh, oral ingested or uh, finally as, um, as enema in the colon. So it would show what happens inside the whole parts of the body. Uh, for example, as we saw, the contrast will be taken up by the blood vessels, uh, or it can even show, even show the bowel, the stomach, and so on. And when injected in the blood vessels, it can be it can give information about how the organs supplied by that vessel are, are working. So uh, let's say, uh, in one of the examples I gave previously, you can see the contrast was uh, taken up by something other than the aorta, other than the vessels. Do you remember what that thing was? What did we say? In the chat. Huh. So that was, um, uh, okay, repeat. So we said in a previous example, in, uh, for example, one of the CTs, uh, we said um, the when we, when we injected the contrast, it wasn't just taken up by the aorta, it also uh, lit up in a certain structure, and that showed an abnormality. What was that abnormality at that time? Yes, so it was a tumor in the liver. 
uh, or basically you can have hemangioma in the liver. So uh, so the contrast will show you what's happening inside the whole parts and also what's happening in the organs themselves. So a difference between an RT and the vein is the duration between the start of injection and the scanning. Remember we said when we put a contrast, you also have to keep in mind uh, the timing. So uh, uh, if you uh, if you inject the uh, contrast and then scan immediately, things that will light up are basically the arteries. But later on, when you when you wait, uh, the um, the contrast will move to certain areas, to specific areas. So other areas will light up. So yes, the contrast will show you what's happening in the vessels, but it depends on the timing uh, and the duration between the injection and when you scan. Okay, so the mass density. There is a difference because there's an interaction between the X-rays and soft tissue, which is proportional to the mass density of the tissue. So the muscles will be one. So you can you compare everything to the muscle. When you say something is hyper dense, hypo dense, or anything, you're comparing them to the muscles. So the muscle will be one. You have the bone is one point eighty five to appear white because it's more uh, more attenuating, and then the fat will be zero point ninety one. Uh, the lung will be 0 0.32, which is black. So this is called mass density. For the uh, the specific uh, structures in the human or uh, human body, you have the bones, muscle, fat, and lung. Now, what about the contrast? Now, you have different contrasts uh, you can use. You can use iodine, you can use barium, you can use air. Now, uh, for iodine, the mass density is 4.93. It's given iodine, and it's, it's used in CT, as we saw previously. Now, mass density 4.93 compared to those it's much higher than all all of those. So uh, would it would it have uh, uh, would it show the images clearer or uh, more dull? To show clear, so it will they will light up. So this is for ID. Barium again is also high, so it's three point five, and uh, you usually don't give it as uh, IV. So barium is barium swallow. Remember where where we use this barium swallow? Um, we showed it in an example previously. Can anyone in the chat tell me? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So yes, temporal resolution. We explained in the temporal resolution example. So uh, we used the barium swallow there, and we used for fluoroscopy. So basically to see an abnormality in the esophagus, in the stomach, in the, in, and so on. But the example we explained with it was the esophagus. So this, again, is a contrast and the, with a mass density of 3.5. Finally, air. You have air, which is around 0 0.0012, and it's used in colonography. So basically, when you uh, use an enema, and uh, to see the colon more clearly, use air. You can use other contrasts, but if you use air, you can see it has very low mass density. So would it show a clearer image compared to barium and IUD, or is it the other way around? Yes, exactly, no. So the higher the attenuation and the mass density, so here you can see IUD will be the highest, or by barium, and air will be the lowest. The lowest. Differential absorption. So um, in this lecture, the doctor uh, basically in the, in the early slides uh, reviewed in general what we discussed in the CT and X-rays and so on, and then um, moved on to specifics. So this is one of the review slides again. Uh, so there is different attenuation depending on the uh, absorption of the X-rays, and uh, those are that uh, those that are not absorbed. So radio opaque will appear bright, while radio lucent will appear dark. So radio opaque, uh, for example, the bones they will appear white. A metal bone, they would be radio opaque. Radio lucent is as you go down uh, from the tissues to the fat and finally to the air, they will look darker. So now going into the specifics, there are a few numbers and a few um, like techniques you need to remember for each examination. Uh, first is NPO uh, status. Does anyone know what NPO stands for? Can you tell me in the chat? Okay, no for oil, nothing for oil, fasting, yes. So basically tell the patient not to eat, not to drink uh, before the procedure. So GA stands for general anesthesia. So a patient undergoing general anesthesia needs to be fasting six hours prior to the procedure. And why do we need that? Because we don't want the patient to aspirate uh, in case any, there is nausea, for example, there is vomiting, they will aspirate. Or it, it will cause abnormalities, it will cause any problems with the patient. So uh, so you tell a patient undergoing uh, general anesthesia to be fasting six hours before the procedure. And for non-GA patients, you follow the procedure protocol. So it depends on you, but uh, basically, if the patient is undergoing anesthesia, fasting six hours prior. 
and you need to keep in mind the weight of the patient. So we don't give the same amount of contrast, same amount of um, uh, anything, any substance to all the patients. So you need to keep amount. Uh, you need to keep in mind the amount, uh, the patient's weight to assess the amount of the contrast given. Okay. Now for asthma. So uh, if the patient is on uh, uh, has control, controlled asthma on medication, they will not require any me measures prior to the uh, administration of non-ionic uh, iodinated contrast. So why do we why do we keep the asthma and allergy in mind? Because iodine basically can cause uh, allergic reaction and infusion reactions can cause um, many things to the patient. So if the patient is allergic, you have to keep that in mind. But if the patient ha is has controlled asthma, it doesn't have any exacerbation right now. They, you do not require any medication. But if the patient has active bronchospasm right now, we refer them back to the uh, physician. And if the, if the patient had any exacerbation within the last 48 hours, it depends on the radiologist. Uh, uh, so the radiologist would decide if he needs pre-medication or is sent back to the ordinary physician. Now for uh, allergies, uh, again, you need to question the patient for allergies. So if the patient is allergic to shellfish uh, or any other substance, so um, and and the patient needs to clarify the severity of the allergy, because in that case, the, the uh, doctor or the radiologist should keep that in mind in case you need to uh, administer any pre-medication before giving the contrast to prevent any allergic reaction. Now, diabetic patients on metformin. Now, for metformin, um, you need to keep in mind that metformin is excreted by the kidneys. So if the patient has EGFR, uh, so if the patient is taking metformin, is a diabetic patient, so he's taking metformin, you need to measure their EGFR, which is the glomerular filtration needs, uh, rate, which is an indicator of the kidney function. So if EGFR is above 30, you do not continue uh, discontinue metformin. So you can continue with metformin normally, and then you start the procedure, you give them the contrast, everything's fine. But if the patient is taking metformin and he has acute kidney injury or uh, EGFR less than uh, four, uh, 30 milliliters, so in that case, you need to discontinue metformin. When? So you discontinue metformin before the procedure and 48 hours after the procedure to ensure that, okay, the contrast period is fine after the contrast is excreted, and then you can uh, continue metformin. Now, uh, why do we care that much about the kidney function with iodine? Because iodine is a contrast, and obviously contrast it won't stay in the body the whole time. Can we have something in chat? Okay, so iodine won't stay in the body the whole time. Iodine has to be excreted by the kidneys. So if the, if the patient has acute kidney injury or EGFR less than 30, there will be problems with excretion. Again, since metformin is excreted by the kidneys, and if the EGFR is low, the kidneys are damaged, then this will give um, like uh, high pressure or high um, demand on the kidney. So you need to discontin discontinue metformin, give the iodine, and then 48 hours after the procedure, you uh, continue metformin again. Okay, renal function assessment. So the, the uh, patient needs, uh, so the doctor needs to uh, um, basically test the creatinine levels and the EGFR of the patient prior to injecting the contrast. And when do you measure basically? You need to, uh, you have different uh, numbers for inpatient and outpatient. So if the, if the patient is in the hospital, um, it basically for inpatient, it needs to be three days prior. For outpatient, it needs to be three months before. So any result uh, three months earlier, which showed normal creatinine, normal EGFR, and then you can give um, IV contrast, but it has to be three days for inpatient. Now, if the patient has end-stage renal disease, but is on regular uh, dialysis, you do not need to withhold IV contrast. We said contrast is excreted by the kidneys. But in this case, patient has end-stage renal disease, but nevertheless, you're still giving them a contrast. Why is that? Anyone tell me the chat? Yes, he is on dialysis. So in this case, yes, the patient's, uh, patient's kidneys are damaged, but um, the patient is on regular dialysis, so they're cleaning their blood, they're cleaning the patient's blood. So in this case, the patient has ESRD, but is on regular dialysis, so you do not need to withhold IV contrast. So you keep all those in mind, unless there's an emergency situation. Just like we said for CT, for X-ray, for anything, if there is an emergency, 
and you need to deal with it right now. You don't care if the patient has a low EGFR, a high creatinine, and so on. If it's an emergency and you have to do it, then it's justified, and then you can uh, go on with the uh, intervention. Now, we said we have to measure the patient's EGFR before contrast. So if the EGFR, uh, EGFR value is above or equal to 60, you can go on, and the patient will receive the normal contrast, which is a low osmolar IV contrast. So this is for, no, uh, for normal patients. Uh, the EGFR is above 60. Meanwhile, some patients will have EGFR between 40 and 59. In this case, okay, the, the patient is not in end-stage renal uh, kidney disease, but uh, they're still not high in the normal level. So in this case, yes, you give them IV contrast, but this time it's isoosmolar, not low osmolar. So isoosmolar means the osmolarity is close to the blood osmolarity. So you don't give them low osmolar, you give them high, uh, you give them isoosmolar in this case. Meanwhile, uh, a patient uh, with the EGFR less than 40 milliliters per minute should not receive IV contrast. Uh, and um, in some cases, the radiologist will decide that uh, it's fine that the patient in this case needs IV contrast. If the radiologist decides to give him either IV contrast, in this case, again, it has to be isoosmolar. So the only case you use low osmolar is if the EGFR is above 2 or equal 60. Now, uh, again, this is just uh, general information. So uh, if a uh, patient has renal impairment, uh, again, you need to take prophylactic measures um, before giving the IV. And this depends on the radiology uh, in the radiologist. And um, next section for the pre-medication. So when do you give the patient pre-medication before giving the IV contrast? Now, you need to keep in mind that pre-medication will, uh, uh, will be effective if the patient has severe contrast reactions, but the minor reactions won't really make a difference. But uh, another thing you have to, to keep in mind is that pre-medication for previous reactions to allergens is not required. So if the patient has history of an allergy to peanuts uh, two years ago, do you give them pre-medication uh, pre before giving the contrast now? No. So if it's a previous reaction, you don't give pre-medication. And uh, pre-medication will be helpful for severe reactions, but not for minor reactions. And um, you need uh, when when you give pre medication or you give IV, you need to monitor the patient, have resuscitation team and crash carts nearby just in case anything happens, and you observe the patient for at least sixty minutes following the injection just to make sure the patient is fine and there are no reactions. Now we talk about pre medication. Uh, when to, to give them? So what is the medication you should give? Now. Every year, we get a question about this. They always get this question. So you need to remember what the medication is, what the dose is, and when you give it. So you need to remember those details very well. So for adults, you give methylprednisolone, 32 milligrams per oral, 12 hours prior, and two hours prior to the examination. So let's say the exam is at 12 in, uh, at noon. So when should uh, the patient take methylprednisolone? patient will take it at midnight, so 12 hours prior, and at 10 a.m., so two hours prior to the exam. Diphenhydramine, uh, which is um, uh, given at 50 milligrams per oral, at one hour prior to the exam. So uh, in this case, if the, uh, if the exam, yes, uh, one more thing you need to keep in mind is that the patient should take it one hour before the exam, not one hour before the appointment. So if, is, so if the appointment is at 12, and then the uh, the patient takes the um, the IV or does the exam hours later. We don't take it at a, depending on the time of the appointment. Keep in mind it's uh, prior to the exam at the appointment. So you need to remember the medication: methylprednisolone, diphenhydramine, their doses, and when do you give them? Methylprednisolone twelve and two hours prior. Diphenhydramine one hour prior. Now, in an emergency. In an emergency, obviously, you can't expect it. So you can't tell the patient take it 12 hours before and two hours before. So in this case, uh, in an emergency, you give uh, 200 milligrams of hydrocortisone or uh, IV four hours before injection, or 50 milligrams of diph diphenhydramine IV or per order within one hour of injection. So again, this is faster. This is less proven, but this is faster than giving 12 hours and two, and two hours before. So in emergency, you give hydrocortisone IV four hours, uh, diphenhydramine IV or PO, uh, within one hour. So just make sure you, you know those very well. Now, again, this is just general information. The, the radiologist must be physically present. You should have crash card just in case. 
uh, high alert medications and uh, uh, high, uh, IV contrast and high alert medication so the patient can uh, develop reactions to the contrast. You should avoid uh, multipunctures in the vein to prevent extravasation of the contrast. And you should have competent uh, technologists uh, do the procedure. Not anyone can do it. And assess that the IV cannula is uh, properly administered uh, before giving the uh, contrast. Again, to prevent extravasation of the contrast, this will cause reactions, this will cause many issues for the patient. Uh, okay, let's say the patient, uh, you suspect that the patient is developing a reaction. First thing you should check, the ABCs. Uh, assess the airway, breathing, circulation, everything. So here you assess the airway and the lungs. You check the vital signs. You place the patient on a monitor to, uh, to assess the circulation, the breathing, and then check the patient's ability to swallow, the patient's color and quality of voice, because obviously if the patient has uh, an allergic reaction, uh, they will have trouble breathing, uh, they will have um, uh, any inflammation and so on, so they can't swallow, they can't breathe, they change the color and the quality of voice. There's a problem, you activate the code, you alert the whole team, uh, everyone is on high alert, so you can manage the patient's condition. Contrast reactions are divided into major reactions, and minor reactions. So major reactions uh, will be something like choking, difficulty breathing, uh, wheezing, like swelling, cyanosis, unresponsive. So you need to memorize, memorize those because they may get you a question, um, give you the patient's presentation and tell you that the patient is uh, cyanotic and unresponsive. So is this a major reaction or a minor reaction? So make sure you know those. And for minor, you have nausea, vomiting, cough, itching, pallor, uh, anxiety, nasal stuffiness. All those are minor reactions, not something affecting the patient majorly. So for the major uh, and for the minor, you need to remember them very well. Uh, they may get you a question again and ask you, is this a major or minor reaction? Now, if the patient is asymptomatic, uh, you just come forward to reassure them and observe the, the, uh, the patient in case he has a late presentation. Uh, if there is no relief or the symptoms persist, you maintain an IV, uh, IV access in case you need to inject any medication, uh, any antihistamines, any steroids, and so on, and you notify the radiologist. Um, okay, so for the patient preparation, so this covered the first, um, the whatever I covered was the first uh, lecture given by Dr. Fizaifa, by the contrast, and now we're going to the patient preparation, uh, last lecture included in the term. Uh, so again, for this, it's basically memorization. Uh, you need to know for the different modalities, what the patient has, has to do. Does the patient have to exercise, the NPO, or um, uh, is there any, anything specific they should, uh, they should do before the, uh, before the uh, radiologic examination? So let's get started. First, uh, you need to keep in mind if there's any allergy to contrast, so you can give them either, either methylprednisolone Diphenhydramine, or uh, hydrocortisone, and so on. So it depends on the case. This is given emergency. This is for normal cases. This is also given emergency. So it depends. And remember the doses. Remember everything about them. Renal profile blood test. So uh, for the renal profile, we said we need to measure the patient's GFR and creatinine levels. So uh, GFR and creatinine will tell you if there's kidney damage, if the kidney is filtering the, the contents well. Uh, filtering the blood well, uh, so uh, be because iodine needs to be excreted by the kidneys. So if you need to give an iodine contrast, if you need to do anything, you have to make sure the kidneys are functioning well. And completed no later than 90 days. So we said uh, three months for outpatient, three days for inpatient prior to the examination. Uh, and for diabetic patients, you um, uh, discontinue metformin before and 48 hours after the procedure if the EGFR is less than 30. Um, okay. So for a CT scan, now I wanted to focus with the headings because uh, different uh, different cases will have different um, requirements for the patient. So here for a CT scan, patient will be uh, NPO two hours prior to the CT scan. Uh, patient may only have clear liquids. And uh, for the medication, does the patient have to discontinue the medication? No. Only thing that uh, they have to discontinue is the metformin. So here, metformin is stopped uh, 48 hours post procedure as I explained previously, but for a normal medication, if, if the patient is taking normal medication, um, it's not a requirement. Now we give oral contrast, and if there is an, a, any allergies, you give pre-medication, and there is no specific preparation if uh, you're doing CT without contrast. Uh, now for contrast, you can give water, gastrocraphin, or barium sulfate. 
Now we can see the images here. Uh, they had they basically um, different contrasts given to the patient to visualize the bowel. So uh, here, this is a normal collapsed bowel. We we'll take them uh, one by one. So here you have no contrast, and uh, you can see that this is just a normal bowel. You have nothing uh, added to it. Now, if you give the patient uh, water, this is what you're going to see basically on the CT. The bowel will be distended for a while, then shrinks again because the water is getting absorbed. Uh, they usually don't get uh, questions from this section, but so I'll just explain for a completion. So here, if you give the patient iodine, and then the lumen will appear bright, and uh, this, these signs are basically showing the motility, uh, motility of the bowel. So here you have um, a barium, 2%. You can see uh, there will be attenuation, and you can see the attenuation very well here in the bowel. And finally, for volumen, volumen is the one you should focus on. Uh, everything before, they never got questions about them. I don't think they necessary to know. But volumen is important because you can see... Um, First thing you can notice here is the increased mot um, motility. So you can see here um, there will be high motility. Uh, and then it will stay in the body. It won't get absorbed. And you, why do we use volume? When do we use it? To differentiate the wall of the bowel. So you can see compared to the other, uh, to, to the other um, contrasts given, compared to this one or the normal one, you can't really tell the wall of the bowel. You just see the bowel as white. But here, uh, you can see the wall of the bowel and the inside. So this will tell you if there is an inflammation. For example, if the patient has Crohn's disease, you can tell uh, by using volume. So volume, keep in mind, uh, it will differentiate the wall of the bowel. And um, this is useful in cases of inflammation, for example. Dastrocrafen is another contrast that you can give for the bowel. Uh, it's uh, useful, especially uh, for the pelvis. You can see cancers, for example. And uh, it's given either or oral or, that, uh, or as rectal enema. Now, for colonography, we're done with CT. Now, for uh, colonography, uh, this is just a diagram to show you the difference between uh, colonoscopy and colonography. So, colonography will take less time, and it's a small probe that's uh, inserted into the patient instead uh, compared to a colonoscopy, where you have the whole scope, so you have a uh, whole tubing inserted in the patient, and this requires sedation, while colonography does not require. There is low radiation, and you can sc screen the entire colon. So, so uh, here, um, again, these are just uh, things you need to memorize. There is not much to explain here. Um, so two days prior to the exam, patient has to be on a liquid diet. And then the patient would take gastrocrafen at six and then drink two to three liters of water. Basically, this is to clean the bowel because you need to screen the bowel. So you don't want it to be full of uh, feces. So they will uh, take the gastrocrafen, take the water, they will uh, clean the bowel. So they So by the time the exam comes, uh, the bowel will be clear to visualize. Now, colonography. This is uh, what you see on colonography. You can see different uh, different things going on. For example, here, can you see this little bump? This bump is a polyp. Polyps are usually benign. In some cases, they can be uh, cancerous, but they're usually benign. So this uh, little bump is a polyp, polyp. You can also see narrowing here in the uh, colon. So uh, these, uh, this narrowing can also be picked up by colonography. Now for uh, esophagogram, the patient should have nothing to eat or drink after midnight uh, or six hours prior to the imaging study. So uh, usually the patient, the doctor will tell the patient not to think, uh, take anything after midnight. But if the uh, exam is valid during the day, they'll just tell them how to say Six hours prior to the imaging study, stop uh, eating or drinking. Now this is the esophagogram. Uh, so basically you take the contrast, you uh, swallow it, and then you check the esophagus. You can uh, uh, you can screen if there is any uh, stricture, if there is any bulging, uh, if there is anything going on like uh, obstruction. So, for example, here you can see uh, there is a line. This is an esophageal web usually. Uh, so you, in other cases, you can see very narrowing. For example, in acarasia. In other cases, uh, you can see obstruction in the esophagus. Uh, if you have an apple core appearance, it will be uh, esophageal cancer. And uh, you don't have to go into details, but uh, this is what you have to remember for es esophageal cancer. Small bowel uh, series, the patient should have nothing to eat or drink again after midnight or six hours prior to the injury study. And this is uh, what you see in a small bowel series. Um, again, uh, you, you can see the small bowel, uh, any narrowing will show, any obstruction, and so on. And barium or air enema. Uh, here, 
uh, you just follow the instructions given with the kit. There is no specific thing you need to know. And uh, this, uh, when you uh, basically the uh, very bar enema, so you go through the colon, you inject something. Um, it can either be the barium contrast or it can be just air enema. So you can see here there is something injecting, and this is the normal appearance of the uh, large intestine. But uh, this would show uh, when do you use the enema. It can show, for example, if uh, there is any interception where the intestines um, like fold into each other. It can show, for example, Hirschsprung disease. Now, this is this picture is not from your slides. This is just extra to show you different uh, pathologies that can happen. Uh, so this can be visualized using barium or air enema. Now, histocypingogram. Now, this is used uh, to visualize the female reproductive system. Here, the, this should be scheduled in the day 10 of her menstruation, beginning with and including the first day of menses. So starting with the first day of menses, you got uh, menses, you uh, count 10 days and then schedule the exam. And here you do this to check for obstruction of the fallopian tube. So this is the normal uh, history of sepingogram. You can see the uterus, you can see the left tube, and then here it's split the dye because here the ovaries will be. And then this is the right tube again. In this case, you can see this is where they're injecting the um, um, contrast material. Uh, here you can see the left tube, you can see the dye going. So can, can you see the right tube? No. So here you have a blockage of one tube. Meanwhile, in this, uh, in this image, you can see uh, both tubes will be blocked because you can't see the spillage. You can't see all of this uh, on neither on the left side nor on the right side. So here, in this case, there is obstruction in uh, both tubes. So uh, now moving on to mammography. Uh, the uh, mammography is basically a screening tool to check the breast tissue. Now, uh, you ask the patient not to use any deodorants, perfume, uh, powder, ointment, or anything under the skin at the day of the appointment. And uh, as you can see here in this uh, diagram, the breast will be firmly compressed during the exam. So uh, usually it's um, usually it's acceptable, but uh, for some patients it will be tough, it will be uh, uh, painful, especially if the uh, breasts are tender. So schedule the uh, appointment when the breasts are least sensitive. So, uh, now moving on to MRI. MRI uh, is basically, you know, you know the MRI machine. I explained previously where it uses the spin of the hydrogen atoms. So uh, it's uh, it stands for magnetic resonance imaging. So it uses a magnet. So one thing you need to keep in mind that the patient should not have any metal. Uh, so there are, there are any there are some other things you need to keep in mind, like uh, if the patient is claustrophobic, um, the the, the uh, tight space and the loud, uh, the loud sounds will affect them. But the main concern here is the metal. So if the patient has any metallic implants, pacemakers, metal clips, stents, or even tattoos or, or anything, they could affect the uh, uh, MRI study. So um, uh, these will be hazardous. So if the patient has those uh, pacemakers, they can't go through uh, uh, MRI. A cardiac pacemaker, insulin pumps. Again, as, as I said, uh, even the tattoos, any uh, cochlear implant, they can all affect because they're metal. And uh, they can uh, they can be picked up by the MRI because it's a magnet, and uh, because uh, there is a risk for claustrophobia, you can give anti-anxiety medication. This is an MRI enterography. So enterography means you are scanning the bowel, and this is an MRI scan, not a CT scan. So uh, here the patient prep is you must arrive at the radiology and be adjusted one hour uh, prior to the examination. NPO four hours uh, prior to the examination, and again drink volumen or equality, which is a laxative. So uh, why do we do this? Again, so we want to clear the bowel. Uh, when we empty the bowel, it will be easier to scan to see any abnormalities. If there is any diverticulum, any tumor, any stricture, anything going on, it won't be easy to visualize if the uh, if the bowel is full. Now here we have MRCP, which stands for uh, MR uh, magnetic resonance. Cholangiopancreaticography. So cholangio and pancreatic. So you're visualizing basically the bile ducts, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. Here, uh, the um, preparation is NPO for six hours prior to the study, both food and water. So here you can see the gallbladder, you can see the ducts, and uh, uh, in this uh, in this modality, in this technique, you're visualizing the duct to see if there is any stone, any blockage, uh, any gallstones, and so on. 
am I abdomen or, or pelvis? Now we talked about uh, am I for the uh, bowel, talked about for the gallbladder and the pancreas, now for the abdomen and the pelvis. Again, uh, NPO, four hours prior to the study. And this is the image you can see. Uh, again, this is not from your slides. This is just added uh, so you can see the difference between this imaging and uh, other modalities. MR for the breast, again, should be scheduled within four, uh, 7 to 14 days of the menstrual cycle. And uh, for the chronic treadmill and dobutamine stress test. Uh, so this is a same day two part procedure. You need to allow three, hour, three to four hours for the test. Um, there's nothing much to say. You the patient has to be NPO six hours prior, no caffeine 12 hours prior because obviously caffeine will uh, accelerate the, car the uh, cardiac muscle. Uh, so uh, there will be increased um, heart rate and uh, the, the test won't be accurate. So the study is performed in two separate days. The patient should uh, allow, uh, sorry, the patient should allow for two hours on the first day, one hour on the second day. And uh, NPO for six hours prior, the, uh, prior to the examination both days. And again, no caffeine for 12 hours prior to the imaging. Now, uh, the DEXA scan is uh, basically a scan to check the bone density. So this will be 40 minutes long uh, and 45 minutes long. And since it's for the bones, so there will be no restriction for food or drink. Now, uh, DEXA scan, but uh, for the whole body, this is what you see. So this is a three to five hours um, test for the whole body. You inject a tracer in the morning and have the actual whole body scan in the afternoon. So to give the uh, the contrast some time to be distributed across the whole body. Again, there will be no restrictions for food or drink. Tim, renal ultrasound. Uh, we talked about ultrasound uh, previously, but now for the preparation, uh, the patient should drink uh, 1.5 liters of uh, uh, or glasses of water. You must finish drinking all of the water one hour prior to uh, avoiding, and you should not empty the bladder. Now, uh, these images will uh, require a full bladder. Why? So, for example, if um, if a woman goes to do an ultrasound, uh, so you need to check for the uterus, for example, you need to fill the bladder. And uh, I, again, also for the renal ultrasound, the bladder should be full, should be distended, so that all the organs will be clearer. So uh, you will be able to obtain a successful image. So if the bladder is not full, you reschedule the appointment, you make sure that the patient drinks water and uh, does not empty their bladder. Uh, and, that, and then in that case, you can do the ultrasound. Uh, now again, uh, for the pelvis, lower abdomen, uh, gynae, and mid lower ultrasound, Again, you need to drink water. You must finish the drinking the water one hour prior and not empty the bladder. Uh, for the upper uh, upper abdomen, uh, general survey ultrasound study, uh, NPO after midnight, the day prior. And this test is basically used to visualize different organs in the upper abdomen, like the aorta, gallbladder, uh, IVC, pancreas, renal stenosis, anything, basically. So here in this case, you can see the liver. You can see the kidney. So usually the kidney will be uh, just underneath the liver. But in this case, you can see ascites, which is the inflammation in the, uh, you have built up a fluid in the abdomen. So here, you can see there's a space between the kidney and the liver. Um, so this can be picked up on ultrasound. Uh, if the patient is undergoing renal transplant, the thyroid and vascular ultrasound studies, there will be no preparation necessary. And finally, for biopsy and fine needle aspirate, the patient will be um, NPO six hours prior. You, will, you have to secure as an IV access, and you have to do a renal profile, CBC, PTT, PTT, uh, PT and PTT. So basically, all the blood tests within three days, and you need to stop anticoagulation. So if you're taking a blood a biopsy or a fine needle aspirate, uh, obviously there will be uh, some bleeding. So you need to stop anticoagulation to make sure the the patient does not bleed continuously. You need to remember those numbers. Remember them very well. So. Um, Aspirin or warfarin should be stopped five days before. Heparin is stopped 24 hours or one day before. So remember those very well. Aspirin and warfarin five days. Heparin 24 hours. And then you fill uh, you fill all the all the forms. You mark the site for the biopsy because in many cases they tell the doctor you need to biopsy, for example, the left kidney, and then they end up biopsy uh, taking a biopsy of the right kidney. So you need to uh, to mark the site, and you complete the station consent form. So that's it for all the lectures included in the term.
this is the final question section for the for all the lectures about contrast and patient preparation. Do you have any questions before proceeding? All clear. Tim. Which of the following is more appropriate regarding uh, iodine containing contrast material? We got the A's. So, correct answer is A, because we said the mass density of iodine will be close to four. And then uh, the various tissues, we have the muscles, for example, at one, you have the air at, uh, the air will be lower, have the fat will be a bit higher than air and so on. But the mass density of iodine is much higher. It's a contrast material that's used to visualize the structures. So the mass density will be much higher. What do you do prior to the administration of IV contrast? Yes, to B. Why? Because we need to check the kidney function. Because iodine needs to be excreted by the kidneys, or any contrast needs to be excreted by the kidneys. So you need to check that the creatinine and the EGFR are normal, uh, because they are the um, like uh, they will tell you if the kidney is functioning well or if there is a renal failure. Which of the following is true regarding pre-medication? Yes, correct answer is B. We said if the patient has previous allergic reactions, we don't give pre-medication. They have acute exacerbation. It uh, depends on the uh, radiologist. Uh, and in case you give the pre, uh, in case the patient has an acute um, allergic reaction, you need to interfere with medication. Okay, thirty-year-old gentleman is known to have a history of contrast and agent allergy. He is scheduled to undergo a CT with intravenous contrast. What is the recommended oral pre-medication dosage? Mm -hmm. Okay. So everyone answering B. That is the correct answer. You need to remember it. As I mentioned, you need to remember the medication, the doses, and the time. So methylprednisone, uh, 32 milligrams per oral, 12 and 2 hours prior. Diphenhydramine, 50 milligrams PO, uh, 1 hour prior to the exam. Which of the following is true regarding this X-ray? Now, this is a concept I didn't mention before, but I want to see if any meaning answer. We got a few C's. Okay, so the correct answer is C. It's a double contrast study. Basically, what happens in a double contrast study compared to a single contrast? Single contrast is, for example, we injected the barium, and then we looked we looked at the structure. So here you can see the barium because it's lighting up. It's white. In a double contrast study, you uh, you give the barium and then you wait. And uh, in a double contrast, you will have both barium and the air. So you can see there are two layers. You can see the white and you can see the dark. So here in this question, you can see the barium and then you can see the air too. So here you have the abnormal structure will take up the contrast. And here in the rest, you have double contrast. You, can, you have both the contrast and the air. What is a major health, health concern with MRI? Let's see. So, correct answer is C. Again, with MRI, our main concern is anything metallic. 
because it's a magnet and uh, anything metallic like cardiac face makers, uh, cochlear implants, any uh, tattoos and so on will um, uh, will be affected by the MRI and will, uh, it can cause localized burns. And that is it for the for this crash course. Uh, please scan the QR code. If you have any questions, you have my contact information, my email, phone number, please feel free to ask me anytime. And if you have any questions later on, uh, or right now, I I can answer. So thank you so much for attending. Allah alaikum. Have a great day, everyone.